our system and our technology can look at every frame of every second of every video. And wow. Are you serious? Every, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, crazy. And that's like the logo recognition side too. Yeah. So like okay. we can pick out if the logo was present or visible yeah, no or way. in focus and things like that. So those that are doing it right, like, yeah, YouTube is, is definitely a big deal. A big shout out goes to Jensen USA, Max's Tires for supporting the inside line. Welcome mountain bikers. You ready? I guess so. All right. Yeah. Let's full on race run. Here we go. Let's yeah. do this race run. Dropping <laughs> Surprise in. Surprise race run. No, no better time than now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's casual. All right. I'm going to look at the camera, but throughout the episode, forget the cameras are here. We'll be fine. But All right. All right. Welcome mountain bikers. Thanks for tuning in to Vital MTB's The Inside Line Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Spomer. Got Jason Schroeder here. And today, long overdue, we have big, rich houseman. In the house. What's up, guys? Glad you're here. Thanks for driving <laughs> Thank in. Thank you. Yeah, stoked to have you and uh, really looking forward to talking about your career, your history, what you're doing now. Yeah. And yeah, dude, right you're, looking, you're looking fit. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have lost some weight over the last six years or so, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like consciously or? Uh, I just quit drinking beer like six or seven years ago and I dropped really? like, like that's 30 it. pounds in like two months and then... Mm -hmm. Uh, just kind of kept going with the, you know, riding, eating healthy, and uh, it's just stayed off. This is about what I looked like in high school, you know, <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> before That's I started drinking beer, you know. Oh, That's <laughs> funny. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Huh. So, uh, but yeah, just the healthy lifestyle, you know, is, is something that was a conscious decision, but then had a few guys with the, like with um, not just fitness, but like eating habits and stuff like that, that I talked to and you know, once you pick up a few good habits, it just kind of keeps rolling. Snowballs yeah, from so. there. Yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. That's sweet. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> glad you're here and right yeah, I'm looking, looking forward to this one for sure. So, right on. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm super stoked this worked out. Yeah. We've, uh, people that are watching this have seen that we've been sitting at this table a lot recently uh -huh. and it's been a lot of uh, people I've known throughout the years, but mm -hmm. more friends I raced with. Yeah. But I'm super stoked to sit down with you because uh, this is this is actually my kickoff for this is a thank you because I would not be sitting here today, a part of Vital, talking to you if it wasn't for the opportunity you gave me to ride for your development team when right I was on. 16. So right on. a huge thank you 16. because I know 16. I'm 28 now. What? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I uh, I'm officially in my late 20s, as Whoa. my girlfriend likes to remind me. Late 20s. I know, right? But uh, but no, seriously though, because you know my my path throughout the cycling world as a racer, and then the connections through the team I was on with you is how I started working for different brands, and yep. you know, I mean the pieces fall the way they do. But if you didn't approach me, uh, I think you messaged me on, on Facebook and yeah. then approached me at a Fontana. Right on. And I remember just being so nervous because at the time, you know, <laughs> you were still racing. Yeah. And I knew who you were and stuff. And I remember you sent me a message on, on Facebook and I was like, this can't be real. <laughs> you know, like he wants to sponsor me, you know, like I was year two of racing mountain bikes. So yeah, green, I mean, the you, green was the you term you always talent. used. I remember those days, <laughs> but just bringing up Fontana, what a legendary place, man. Oh yeah. man. It's, it's surprisingly, like, we've had a lot of discussions yeah. about Fontana mm -hmm. just with people we've talked to recently and just Crazy. how much that has influenced yeah. kind of our scene. A lot of heads have come out of there. That's mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Wait, and it goes way back. I mean, before me, there yeah. were still people that came mm -hmm. out of there. So hmm. I wonder, uh, I wonder how many names we could pull out of the hat from that. <laughs> There's a lot. It is a long list. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, uh, we chatted with Charlie Harrison last week. Uh, and so we kind of went down that same uh, rabbit hole because it it's, if you've ever been at such a unique spot, like yeah. it holds a special place in downhill history. It sure how many does. people have come out of it, but compared to what you think of, of most places you go ride downhill, uh -huh. it's so, you know, yeah. it's a small hill in suburbia, inland right. empire and short track, like nothing about it really looks like mountain biking but yeah i think it you know thinking back like probably one of the biggest advantages that place had was that it raced early in the year and you yep. could race there mm -hmm. and then yep. the type of like competition that would show up like mm -hmm. i think uh, even though the hill didn't like you know present itself as like a world cup level mm -hmm. course it was like here in the beeps going against guys that you knew you were going to race later yep it was just a good benchmark for, yeah uh, for where to head off to the season from there but totally. uh, yeah it's crazy <laughs> and 
before your time like not that you're super ancient or anything but like who was racing there like before you got there well ec was racing there i remember guys like pete longkarevich whoa yeah, yeah pistol pete pistol right? pete yeah. longkarevich he was a local there was this all donnie putting it on back then too yeah okay yeah wow. yeah mm. he's a legend in his own right yeah. um but yeah i mean i think by the time i got there you know it was still guys like colin bailey and cody warren mm -hmm. and myself ec was still dominant there mm. And then um, there started to be a trend coming where uh, guys like would come over from overseas, like from Australia. I remember when Kovorik showed up mm -hmm. and just crushed us on flat pedals. And we were oh, just really? like, there's no way he can beat us on the wall. <laughs> and he was like, mm -hmm. you know, eight seconds up on us in a few races or something like that. <laughs> Holy crap, um, on that short track? Yes. <laughs> That's crazy. It was crazy. just like unheard of and just, mm -hmm. you know, it would just level up everything yeah. once a year or whatever. But. <laughs> The uh, wall. The wall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I have a vivid memory of probably one of like the first races we did as a team. And you would go on the wall and yeah. cheer us on. Yeah. And like <laughs> kind of getting down afterwards. And you're like, yeah, like, you know, you definitely can put in some more effort on the wall. <laughs> and you had a video of me pedaling. And oh, I was yeah. like, oh, gosh, I yeah. look terrible. I look so tired. And you're like, yeah, not even two minutes in. <laughs> yeah. You're so exposed in that section, too. Mm -hmm. so yeah, like, there's no faking it. Nope. Mm -hmm. Nope. That was where it... Uh, you could uh, learn a lot about kids on that wall, for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. But it was more a mental thing than anything else. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it is funny. Now, the the beeps uh, in wintertime, you know, like growing up here, you forget that most people aren't riding bikes this time of the year. Mm -hmm. And it is pretty valuable. That and then just having competition. Yeah. You know, everybody's competitive, but also quick. And it yep. just fuels everybody getting faster. In the course, too, like I remember that like, you couldn't make a lot of mistakes and try to win. True. And, uh, yeah. You know, you had to be really perfect. It was in a condensed version, but mm -hmm. to have a perfect run there and to like get it done, like yeah. mentally, it like set you set you on your way mm -hmm. for the rest of the season. But yeah, and that's funny. There was like Norba's of Fontana back yeah. in the day, and then we had a Pro GRT there one year. Right. Yeah. It is it is funny. Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, let's get into Rich Hausman history. All right. Let's let's history. do the. I got to remember all this stuff, man. Like, I know. Geez. I mean, um, I'm sure you've told it before, but for anybody that haven't, I'm, hasn't heard, I mean, how'd you, uh, where'd you grow up? How'd you get involved in bikes? Just start from there. <sighs> wow. Um, I did grow up in the Northwest. Okay. Um, Seattle, Tacoma area. Um, obviously I started with, uh, with BMX, mm -hmm. um, started really young, started at four, four and a half or something like that. I uh, had a two wheel background from my parents. My dad owned and uh, rode motorcycle, owned a motorcycle shop, rode motorcycles. And uh, just on a random day, we were at like a little corner mart. A couple guys walked in in leathers and jerseys. And uh, my dad was pretty outgoing. I was like, oh, what track are you guys going to? And they were like, oh, we're going to this. It used to be called uh, Sumner was mm -hmm. the was the track my dad was like Sumner I never heard of that track mm -hmm. and they were like no we're racing BMX and we were like <laughs> what and so literally like followed him to the track mm -hmm. and uh showed up looked at it and was just like this is rad I want to try this <laughs> no way. and uh Dad just went out to the old J.C. Penny, got me a rig. <laughs> J.C. Uh, Penny, what was it? What bike was it? It was called the Eagle. <laughs> I just always remember that. It was blue with like gold wheels, uh -huh. you know, and uh, <laughs> and started racing and um, had a lot of success quick. Um, you know, went through the full like I think it was maybe like a year of novice to intermediate to expert, but then. Uh, Started going fast locally. Uh, dad bought me a race bike after that. Um, went to one national, did pretty good, and uh, got noticed by um, back then it was Hutch Bicycles. Yeah, and uh, Hutch, Hutch was sick. Yeah, I didn't obviously know much about it back yeah. then, but uh, they approached my dad and said, "Oh, we want you to race, or you know, want you to get on the Hutch team." And I was six, and that's crazy. Holy cow! Just six years old. Six years old, and. <laughs> I mean, it was definitely a world when we didn't come from money. We, it wasn't like my dad could send me to nationals. I mean, I think I, the story goes is like to get to my first national, my dad sold like two of his own motorcycles Oh, really? just wow. to get me there Wait. kind of a thing. And, but got there and, and went fast mm -hmm. and got noticed quick. So anyways, got onto Hutch and, um, basically, yeah, I mean, the BMX career was from about six to 15 and, Rode for some pretty iconic teams, including Hutch, Free Agent, Redline, you know, and had a good career at on the BMX side. 
Um, and then got out of BMX when I was about, I think around 15, 16 years old, I was Mm -hmm. in high school. I had found basketball. I was into hoops. Uh, it was totally different, you know, team Mm -hmm. sport from what I was doing and BMX was just completely foreign, but I loved it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, was this, were you still up in Pacific Northwest? Still up in the Northwest. We had moved from like the Tacoma area, Seattle area down to Vancouver, Washington, Mm -hmm. right on the border there. And, um, Anyways, got into basketball and just put the bikes away. Like, was pretty much over it. I'd kind of, I won't say I'd done everything, but I'd won a world championship. I'd won national championships. We were on number one teams. Like, wow. all of that was kind of, mm-hmm. you know, it happened. And uh, so this hoops thing just like completely consumed me. Hmm. And of course, it was like I, I went straight to like, I'm going to the NBA, like, <laughs> I'm, you know, cause yeah. was, in bikes was, I was already, you know, at the top there. So uh-huh. there's no reason I couldn't do that. And I mean, I, I had, I was good. Like mm-hmm. there was, but in my area and, mm-hmm. uh, I always remember we, I had made this all-star team. It was, I think my junior year in high school and we went down to Vegas and it was like, uh Oh, like, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make the NBA, you know, and it, my brain like was like, Ooh, this might not, maybe you can go to college. But like my dream kind of like was squashed because mm-hmm. I just, I just couldn't see myself being that athletic mm-hmm. or, you know, I, I mean, I was, but just not at that level. Yeah. And was, so was it like a skill thing or was it just like the dedication and focus on skills, it? Skills, uh, skillfully, like fundamentally, I, that's probably where I'm, I was good, but uh, just athletically, like mm-hmm. just run faster jump higher like it was like i couldn't really see myself getting to that level that quick and so i won't say it like squash my dream like it was more mm-hmm. like okay maybe i won't make the nba but <laughs> maybe i can like yeah. you know go to college or whatever and stuck with it uh through my senior year um in the meantime my little brother gary um he had raced bmx with me throughout most of my career mm-hmm. and then he actually was on factory gt bmx team and had get, been given a a a mountain bike, you know, when he was like 15, 16 years old Mm -hmm. from GT. And like at that time, um, Eric, our brother-in-law, EC Mm -hmm. Carter, Mm -hmm. uh, he had also transitioned over to mountain bikes. And so Mm -hmm. like, it was like, I had like my side eye on it, like, Oh, that was cool. Like you Mm -hmm. guys are doing this mountain bike thing. And then all of a sudden, like the goggles, the helmet, like getting some parts and they were, you know, that was like, it was there, but Mm -hmm. I was still playing hoops and, uh, (laughs) So like my what senior, year was that roughly? It was like? 95. Okay. So uh, 96, I graduated. So my mm-hmm. senior year, uh, was still playing hoops and was still pretty into it and got a couple offers to play at like some Division two schools. Hmm. But uh, it kind of just so happened that my dad caught wind that I was like semi-interested in the bike stuff again. Mm-hmm. Gary had like, he had made it onto that uh, RockShock Devo team mm-hmm. that was pretty popular mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. And... Uh, I, I, don't, I didn't realize he did this, but he like went up in the attic, grabbed like six old BMX frames, cruised over to the local bike shop and traded the guy for <laughs> a Foes Weasel and brought the That's bike so home cool. and was like, hey, I think you should try this. That's pretty cool. And in cool. the meantime, you know, my little brother was talking smack. Oh, you can't beat me and all this stuff. And, <laughs> and, and he was good. He was already like uh, yeah. winning junior X classes and stuff. So we literally like got a pieced my bike together and said, well, we'll go race Mount hood. And, and, and this is all downhill focus, like not all really downhill. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, Eric had, uh, I learned really quickly that slalom was kind of like that transition mm-hmm. from BMX. Mm-hmm. I mean, Eric, uh, Lopes, King boots, all these guys were, well, Cullinan, I guess boots wasn't there yet, mm-hmm. but these guys that who I knew since I was six years old from the BMX world yeah. were like having some success in the slalom stuff. But downhill was definitely still like getting its legs and like Mm -hmm. it was cool and anyways he bought me this bike and we went up to mount hood we raced junior x and i actually won Hmm. and uh beat gary and uh (laughs) that like lit the fire like right away it was ooh, i I like bikes again and uh downhill itself was like to me was just like that mix between bmx and moto you know like Mm -hmm. and it was cool enough to like you know it was still early but uh, I thought I could do it. You know, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, maybe I'll try this, you know, because hoops was just, it was starting to fizz out. So I remember like going straight back to school, telling my coach, like, I don't want to play college ball. And he was just, he had no idea I even came from bikes. Like mm-hmm. I never told anybody that I was in BMX or anything like yeah. that. So he was just like, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. And, um, uh, that was 96. 
and I had raced a couple local races. I think between me and Gary, we either won the pro slalom or were first and second in junior X. And we were kind of our own little competition. And I was just basing a lot off of what Gary was doing because he was already in the mix. Mm -hmm. And then EC was in the back of my ear kind of, Oh, you could do this kind of a thing. And so we on a whim just said, we're going to go to mammoth for that. That year in 96 was where the national champs were. Mm -hmm. And, uh, went to mammoth and ec was riding for that troy lee privateer team that year and it was him jimmy kite and jimmy deaton mm -hmm. and uh so we show up at mammoth i had no idea what the kamikaze was but uh <laughs> we went to the top and i remember coming my first run down just like this is ridiculous like because i was racing at mount hood it was legit like trail side i mean yeah. like single track and roots and stuff like mm -hmm. it was normal i would call it but yeah. kamikaze was not normal <laughs> for and, sure and uh i was definitely out of my element but i was a bigger kid six three you know like had a little weight under me and so like uh i always remember like sitting at the condo with uh, jimmy deaton and ec and jimmy was like you know why don't you ride with me tomorrow like sneak up in there and we'll, mm. we'll do a run and uh i remember going up with jimmy taking off out of the thing and like blew my mind. Like he was riding, you know, about six inches off the regular trail, but like doing these lines at Kamikaze where he had already been a legend mm -hmm. and I didn't yeah, really like know he was... that he was just a legend. He kind of knew the place. Mm -hmm. And I remember after one run, I was like, Oh my God, like my teeth aren't chattering out of my head. Like mm -hmm. I'm on a line that like, it just felt better. And, mm -hmm. um, just by being off the main line yeah. a little bit. And he just kind of had a, I mean, he was, he instead of like he just had different lines like mm -hmm. i was just riding the goat trail straight down every time and like just you know thinking i was going fast but i wasn't mm -hmm. and within a short amount of time he had like kind of showed me the way and uh we raced the junior x class and i won mm -hmm. and for winning that and the way the norba worked you were then the national champion so my first race was mammoth national I win. So then they call me the national champ. Gary got second, by the way. Oh, <laughs> and it was just, you know, that was, that definitely was fueling the fire. But, um, I remember being on the podium and then they're like, you know, they brought up the Jersey and like, mm -hmm. Oh, you're the national champ. Now it's kind of like fish out of water. Like what does the national champ? I only raced one race. Like, mm -hmm. but even though you'd had that success in BMX, is it just because it was one race and you got it compared to how BMX yeah. worked or well BMX. I mean, there was like points all year and okay. then, you know, yeah. you end up going to the it's like a championship. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Not a surprise. Yeah. This mm -hmm. was more like, yeah, I only raced one race. So how am I the national mm -hmm. champ? But I remember being on the podium and like them explaining to me that, okay, the worlds are in Cairns, Australia this year and we're sending you. And I was like, <laughs> you're sending me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Your, your way is paid. You're the national champ. You're going to oh, Cairns. Wow. And huh. so Crazy. I was just like, all right you know like okay this is cool you know and so then they had you we, ever been out of the country no okay yeah i mean i'd raced in whistler that mm -hmm. uh or in canada but um i never did make it out of the country racing bmx um mm -hmm. but anyway so they they fund the bill i go um i get to cans i mean still just green that was literally my second national was yeah. the world's in cans that's wild <laughs> that's so and insane, uh <laughs> i was I would say I was like, I was pretty surprised at the course. Like it was a different long with a long pedal at the mm -hmm. end. And, uh, I was out of shape. Like I just could not like yeah. make a full run. And I remember like after a few runs of practice, I remember telling EC, like, how am I supposed to hold on the whole way? Like, <laughs> because I would try way too hard at the beginning. And then, mm -hmm. but, uh, we went through practice. I remember just crashing my brains out, like, every practice run i was so scraped up head to toe Gnarly. and uh it started raining before the uh, qualifier and uh, i remember it was so slick i like asked eric i'm like they're just gonna postpone it right <laughs> like they'll, they'll just wait until it dries out right and he was like what are you talking about like, <laughs> so <laughs> i go up for the the practice or the quality run i think i qualified like 31st i always remember that and i felt like this is dumb like i can't do this like i'm not gonna do this and yeah. uh it dried out for the final and um i had a good run and i think i got sixth and was the top american there and uh, that definitely like I will say like made me feel like, Oh, I can do this. Like mm -hmm. this is okay. And like this, I'm not a fish out of water. Mm -hmm. And I always remember trying to pedal the last bottom section and I was running flat still just mm -hmm. bands and flats yeah. come from BMX. Like yeah. I didn't know any different. 
And I got so tired that my legs wouldn't like pedal. So I just took my feet off. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. And just coasted for a while. <laughs> and, uh, I always remember that, but, uh, anyways, that definitely like getting six there, I got noticed, um, that next year in 97, I signed with Rotec and hmm. signed my first pro oh, deal. Cool. So I didn't yeah. do the semi pro thing or anything. I went junior X straight to the pro. Wow. Okay. And, uh, you know, got on the team with Schofield, Terrianis, EC, and myself. Wow. That was the Rotec team. Dude, that's hmm. sick. And that definitely, you know, got me rolling. Yeah, and, yeah for uh, sure. From 97 till, gosh, I wish I knew every all my years. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I did get a chance to ride for some pretty cool teams and cool people. I went from Rotec. I had one year there where I was on a privateer like GT deal. But then I uh, went straight into riding for Johnny T onto the Tomac team and had like a four year oh, run. Yeah, that's right. With Johnny. And uh Dude, I do you remember going out to Moab? Yes. The race out there. That was the first time I ever saw you in person. Was that like ninety eight maybe? Because yeah. I just yeah. some squid. I'd lived in Boulder and it was went probably ninety nine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I think ninety eight I had like a privateer year. Yeah. And uh then ninety nine is when I signed with Tomac. Okay. But yeah, I yeah. do remember that. I remember seeing you guys and being like Whoa, there's Tomac, right? There's Houseman, <laughs> right? Yeah, you're on the new bikes oh, and stuff. Cool. Like, yeah. yeah, being super amped. Yeah, that was an, that was an experience. Yeah. Funny side <laughs> yeah, story like about payment. that. Yeah. I always remember that race because uh, Johnny was still racing, mm -hmm. um, and we got to the top, and uh, we we were doing our like just sit on our bike and like back pedal and stuff. They couldn't. Mm -hmm. We didn't have wind trainers at the time, but Johnny was like synonymous with having his rollers. So he brings his rollers up to the top. And gets on them, and they always made the loud like, <laughs> and, and everybody's like staring at Johnny, and so like swear to God, thirty minutes before his run, he like one hopped off of his rollers, rode over to the line where the the downhill was, mm -hmm. and then went into a track stand, and sat <laughs> in a track stand for like what seemed to me like an hour, but it was probably only like fifteen twenty minutes, but, but like <laughs> and never put his foot down. And I was just like, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing that? And it, you could just see it building. Like everyone just kept like, look, look, he's not putting his foot down. He's yeah. not putting his foot down. And like, and then rolled into the start, stayed in the track stand and then took off. And it was just like one of those most legendary wow. things I've ever no seen. Way. That's a power yeah. move. It, yeah. It was <laughs> Full intimidation factor. Move. Yeah. It's so sweet. Yeah. But anyways, I think, uh, Johnny, I always, you know, call it out because he, he definitely made me a pro. And the way he approached everything, the mm -hmm. way he trained, just his mindset, um, I think was an excellent lesson for the rest of like what I ended up being as a career. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because it was a solid four years I was with him. I think right until the end where, you know, his budget dried up, I was still like, I'll just stay with you. I'll, I'll just, I'll ride for free, you know, like, <laughs> cause yeah. I was just like, he was the guy that, mm -hmm. that really kind of like, you know, made me a pro. That's the only way I can say it. He just, his, his whole approach was certainly tip top. But, um, uh, then, uh, from Johnny, I think, where did I go from there? Oh, foes after that? Foes after that, then to Yeti. Mm -hmm. And, um, I kind of finished, you know, the main going after it with Yeti. Um, yeah. I'd even transitioned off from like a full-time racer to like a manager race racer mm -hmm. with Yeti, which was kind of cool. I got a little experience at that managerial role. Um, but still had a chance to be around some pretty awesome riders, yeah. Graves and Blinkensop and mm -hmm. Leo and kind of help them through their career to de riff. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. so I guess that was, you know, sort of my send off as far as like, <laughs> uh, chasing the dream, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I still ride today, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and I still love it. And, uh, but the mountain bike thing was, was a cool experience. It just kind of came out of nowhere. For sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Were you were you riding moto back then too? Like at the very beginning of it all, like when you're racing BMX and all that, were motorcycles in your life? They were in my life, but I wasn't riding yet. Um, I think okay. I'd only had like an XR 100 and it was just like this kind of putts around bike. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd ride the hell out of it and, and go as fast as I could. But it was like by the time um, the racing thing came about, I went straight into BMX. And my dad like had a few friends who got hurt on, on motos. Uh, he was pretty good friends with Danny Chandler Magoo, mm -hmm. who got, who mm -hmm. broke his back. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was kind of like, Ooh, we don't want you to do that. And it was kind of a scary thing. So, and then BMX took off so fast. I mean, by the time I was six, I was on a factory team mm -hmm. traveling by myself too. Mm -hmm. My parents didn't have the money. So that's crazy. <laughs> uh, they were sending me 
you know, to meet the team manager at races and I was gone twice a month going to nationals wow. at like six years old. Yeah. So I definitely grew up fast. Mm -hmm. And okay. So you had BMX, you had basketball, then you got into mountain bikes. Yeah. In between then was their moto or did you just go straight into riding mountain bikes straight and into mountain learning bikes. how to handle it? Cause yeah. not every BMXer can do yeah, that. Yeah. No doubt about it. Um, I would say EC helped me a lot with that transition. Okay. Um, you know, EC struggled a little bit in downhill early on and it wasn't until kind of later in his career, he started figuring out the downhill thing, but slalom was, you know, where he found his footing really quick. And, uh, we also did good at slalom. We had some good competition up in the Northwest guys like Bart McDaniel, uh, Jason Siegfried were some names, mm -hmm. Daryl Young. These guys, you know, had, were pretty good pros at the time, but we didn't race Junior X Slalom. We wanted to always ride the pro class. Mm -hmm. So we got fast, quick racing those guys in Slalom. So Slalom kind of just came naturally. But uh, it wasn't until I started riding for Johnny that the downhill thing started coming about a little bit more. My fastest years in downhill were definitely with Johnny, for sure. Okay. But you'd race dual and four cross too, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm... A I think a lot of riders are like, oh man, I'm going to heat with Rich. Like, okay. <laughs> I know that's, that was my question. Cause I, I remember that part of your racing career a lot yeah. more than like the downhill yeah. side, maybe. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. The, the four cross thing, once it came about, um, was also a pretty natural progression mm -hmm. from the BMX days. Um, I always felt like at a disadvantage because I couldn't get down that damn first straightaway. Like some of these little guys <laughs> mm -hmm. like EC and boots and for sure lopes, but track speed wise and just having a little bigger size. It was mm -hmm. rough. Um, yeah. and even there was a few years in between there. Spomer might remember these days, but there was the world cup dual stuff where they right. put two guys on yep. the course. I love that because <laughs> it was rough and the rougher, like, the better, like a four cross style track or with just, just two people, two just people, two yeah. people yeah. Okay. and winner advances. <laughs> Yeah. It was rough. Yeah. Full elimination. Full elimination. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot going down, but that part huh. there was like just having a little bit more size and just, yeah. and knowing how to go through turns and bump guys from BMX days. Like mm -hmm. it gave us a big advantage. Uh, it didn't last very long. No. Yeah. yeah. Just a couple of years, huh? Just a couple yeah, of like years. Yeah. Like 01 national or 01 world champs had yeah. dual at Vail, I think. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But yeah, the four cross, I think the year that, um, I won the Nord Norva title for the four cross, it was still split. There was a couple of races that were slalom. And a couple races that were uh, four crosses. Okay. So, um, but yeah, four cross definitely over the years was was my forte. Um, downhill is just a different beast. Mm -hmm. um, you sort of have to have a different mentality. And at that time, there wasn't very many people doing both at a high level. There was only a couple. Yeah. Graves was the name that sticks out. Mm -hmm. Gracia yep. was another guy that could do it, but definitely not a bunch. Yeah. It was either you're a downhill or a four cross guy. Yeah, so. sure. Did you? Which, uh, like four cross slalom downhill, which one did you enjoy the most? You think over the years, looking back, I love slalom, mm -hmm. um, four cross just was so about getting out of the gate and getting down the first straightaway and blocking everyone all the way down. Whereas slalom, I mean, in the early days, you didn't get a chance to practice. Hmm. So you had to like stare at the course and your first run was qualifying. Oh, interesting. Well, really? Yeah. <laughs> and so, huh. They should do that again. Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> like blind run. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it weeded out a lot of people early. Yeah. Um, you had to have like a set of skills that just, or even just to be able to look at a track and know how it's going to develop. Mm. But looking back, those were fun because if you made it to the later rounds, round of eights, or even sometimes semifinals, I had a lot of trouble beating EC or Lopes in the finals. Mm. But um, how fast you would be going at the end of the night mm. compared to when you started was yeah. pretty cool. And the courses developed a lot like a downhill course. There was ruts and sections that you had to be very aware of. Mm. So I think uh, looking back, it was a lot more tech than I think people understood. I watched a lot of BMX pros come try slalom mm -hmm. and it just didn't have it. Yeah. yeah. yeah and so. tracks were mostly kind of flat and natural, not a bunch of green yeah. berms, right? Yeah. Not a lot of berms, but they would form up. Mm -hmm. I mean, ruts, you know, mm -hmm. and different from manicured berms. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there was a lot more tech involved in slalom back in the day. Whereas four cross just seemed like brutal strength. Like <laughs> just get, like I said, get down the first straightaway and block people. Yeah. Away, you know? <laughs> but, uh, dude, this is so sick. Oh, I, know. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about like, Slalom kind of making a comeback right now. It seems like it's got some steam again. Yeah. Like I, I haven't, I've never raced slalom. Really? I'm surprised you never made me race slalom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I never raced BMX. Yeah. But, uh, but I love the look of like old slalom tracks where yeah. like they're, 
there's just like more bike handling and stuff and like sure. sea otter now and um what kyle's putting on like they're epic looking tracks but yeah. they're pretty groomed you know yeah i don't know it, i mean i'm hyped Psalm's coming back but i'm i'm a huge fan of it mm-hmm. i think uh, there's definitely got to be the environment's got to be right. The course has got to be right. Even the announcers has got to be right. You know, totally. yeah. the old school Larry Longo that knows his stuff and knows what a differential is mm-hmm. and knows, you know, how to look up on there and see what's going on. There's a lot mm-hmm. that goes down in a slalom, but mm-hmm. I guess if you're uh, if the vibe is low or mm-hmm. someone doesn't really know it or, mm-hmm. you know, that it could maybe take it away a little bit, but I'm a huge fan of slalom. That's yeah. for sure. I think uh, as far as it making a comeback, um, I think there's also some logistics with timing and how long it takes to run one and stuff mm-hmm. like that, that might play a factor. Yeah, yeah. We talked about it the other day and just like at the end, it sort of slows down just mm-hmm. because, you know, you have a run and then you got to get back to the top and there's yeah. not as many people stacked up, but yeah, yeah. But it seems like there are things you could do to the announcer. mitigate that. Yeah. Yeah. Get yeah. The hype, keep the hype going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It makes a huge difference for mm-hmm. sure. Um, but I'm a fan. Yeah. I, I like it. I think it does require a little more skill than the four cross stuff Mm -hmm. personally. Yeah. Um, We rode suspension bikes back in the day and set them up for slalom for Mm -hmm. sure. Um, I I listened to a lot of setup tips from EC (laughs) back in the day. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, there was, there was some science to it for sure. I bet how to make it pedal, but also turn at the same time was Mm -hmm. like two different things. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the the chatter that would come late in rounds and stuff like that, if your bike wasn't set up, you weren't going to make yeah. certain turns or, you know, get high in front of turns or any of that stuff. So do you remember what you were doing versus stock back then? You know, like, okay, what suspension, tire pressure, like, do you remember specifics? Um, at that point, there was a certain part of my career where platform stuff started coming back into shock or coming into shocks. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that came down to, um, trying to get down straightaways in a fast without a Bob. Mm-hmm. And, um, so we would run, uh, first of all, very slow rebound, mm-hmm. um, but, or sorry, uh, a lot of compression, but the rebound needed to have something over little chatter. And so I just remember running big time air pressure in, mm-hmm. in the rear shocks, but mm-hmm. still trying to get it to feel supple on the little stuff, um, was a challenge, mm-hmm. but you know, I think the the transition was those from there, um, we rode suspension bikes mostly in slalom, mm-hmm. like the hardtails, just, you couldn't make them turn at a certain point. And then when four cross came around, you had to have two bikes. Like no, we would run a hardtail and four cross. Hmm. It really didn't matter. It was mainly just like probably the first straight as well. Like yeah. a little yeah. bit faster, yeah. lighter yeah. and stiffer. And, and to try to get a four cross like suspension or sorry, a slalom suspension bike to go down a four cross first straightaway, it was almost like yeah. you're at a huge dis- yeah, disadvantage. Tank. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, the, as far as tire pressure goes, um, it was mostly sidewalls that we were, that we were mostly concerned with because mm-hmm. the ruts were so nasty and not manicured that if you didn't run enough air, you would just peel them off the bead. Um, but too much, you know, mm-hmm. like you weren't going to make turns very good. So there was a, there was quite a bit of tech that was going into that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Did you did you have custom bikes back then? That's a question I had for later on. But yeah. I mean, you're tall, obviously. Yeah. And bikes were really small back then. Yeah. Did you have custom frames? Or? I did. Okay. Yeah. From literally that first year on Rotec. Um, in fact, I just saw an old school photo someone posted um, the other day where we were running a uh, a hardtail Rotec with triple clamp White Brothers forks on it. I saw that oh, photo yeah. and I was like, we got to bring this back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, luckily enough for Eric or from for me, EC had a uh, such a mind around uh, mm-hmm. geometry and bike, and he saw really early that anything stock wasn't going to fit me. So that first year, we made a custom. It was made by this uh, frame builder called Simonetti, mm-hmm. and um, he made that bike for me specifically. And I think it had like a twenty-four and a half inch uh, like top tube reach on it. It was wow, it was yeah. long, mm-hmm. um, but we used that frame geometry for the rest of my career wow yeah so that's interesting yeah yet he made the same geometry for me and everything as Mm -hmm. as i even got to that late and i just kept the the numbers Mm -hmm. and just (laughs) like you you gotta make it this long (laughs) (laughs) oh that's pretty cool cool. yeah yeah because they didn't even have like reach back then it was all about your top tube length right yeah Mm -hmm. 24 holy cow that's huge (laughs) yeah it was long yeah yeah that's massive yep um why do you think four cross died you have any uh Hmm. insight into that 
because we don't i when i first started racing which and it was like a thing still and yeah. then it just sort of like fizzled out i don't yeah. know i never was into it but uh my my strongest opinion is the courses were tough to make yeah and tough to make fun mm-hmm. and tough to make exciting um mm-hmm. if they weren't set up properly the racing was pretty boring mm-hmm. it was so much about that first straightaway and then to watch some guy block everybody on the insides all the way down just wasn't that cool yeah. until somebody ran into him and there was a crash and then people would like think that's cool but mm-hmm. there was only like a handful of courses throughout like that four cross heyday that i thought were like set up super cool mm-hmm. um and a lot of times ec had a lot to do with that hmm. he was still into the course building side and uh yeah i think yeah i think it was courses to be honest with you um yeah because i mean every venue is gonna have to basically make a custom downhill custom. bmx track yeah. Yeah. yeah and wide enough and with enough features that you could pass you know and if you weren't really passing and it was just a follow the leader all the way down it just wasn't yeah. very easy on the eyes mm-hmm. it was a little bit more like eh, that wasn't that cool kind yeah. of a thing so whereas a slalom you can put it on a grass hill and you know that head-to-head racing was like it can still be cool yeah so yeah that that might be my my strongest opinion of why, but that makes I'm sure sense. there's more to it. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> um, what's your uh, most proud moment from racing over the years, or maybe best result? How do you want to look at it? Mm. Anytime you beat Gary or Gracie, <laughs> or uh, <laughs> what stands let's out? Let's see. Um, I I won a. Uh, it was actually a slalom, but it was a World Cup in Virginia mm-hmm. on, in 97. Um, I was riding for Rotec. Um, I had, I did not qualify for the downhill because I broke my Rotec in half. Um, <laughs> oh, literally at the bottom, I always remember I, I was laying on the ground, bike was folded up next to me, and I like looked up and it was Mert Lawwell on, over the top of me. He's like, Rich, are you okay? And I was like, <laughs> just fuming mad. Uh, told him to get out of my way, took the bike, rode over to this creek and like hucked my frame into the creek. No <laughs> and way. the pieces of your yeah. frame, <laughs> both pieces yeah. and walked back to the you pits. You still look mad about it right now. <laughs> oh, so mad. That was like the third bike I had broke that year. Oh. Um, oh, man. but, uh, I remember walking back to the pits and, and telling Eric, like, I'm never riding that bike again, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and then, uh, he was like, well, why don't you just go, do, go do the slalom, you know? And like, just just go have fun in that. And, uh, I had just a lot of anger and aggression in that race. And I remember going against Tomac in like the round of eight and, uh, beat him. And, uh, wow. that like, I was like, I can do this. I can do this. And then I went against Schofield my teammate and beat him. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it was working out where I was going to go against Lopes in the final. And he flatted in his like second run. So I went against, I can't remember the guy's name, mm-hmm. but, uh, I won and it was a world cup and it was like the, like the high and low, right? Like I was like so bummed on the downhill thing, but won that. And, uh, that was definitely like my first pro win as well. And, uh, but still, I, that sticks out in my yeah, memory. Yeah, that's that was, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Throw the bike in the creek. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. I was, that was the downhill side of Rotec was not my favorite. <laughs> I, I broke four bikes, but. Oh, that's rough. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you have any idea what prize money you might've made from winning that race back then? Mm, I don't, oh, man. I don't. I'm curious. Cause like you jumped right into, you know, being on teams and stuff. Like, yeah. were you able to make a living and have that just be your focus for those years on road tech and Tomac and all that? Yes. But like for a lot of the early years I was living with EC okay. and, um, was that down here in so down here? Yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd moved as soon as I turned like 18, I had bailed out from the Northwest and came down and lived with EC mm-hmm. and chased that, like chase exactly. the dream. Um, I remember my first contract with Rotec was $12,000 a year. Mm-hmm. So it was a grand a month. And, uh, that was enough to like pay a little bit of rent, l- l- kind of live on my own. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was living yeah, with no my responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then, yes, I did make it a lit, you know, uh, I won't call it a, a living because I was still doing things like, um, working odd jobs in the, in the winters Mm -hmm. and making a little extra money just to kind of like live off of. Yeah. But I was able to put everything away and go race and, and make enough doing that, but certainly never made a, <laughs> a, a legit living off of it. I was gonna say because you were with EC during like some yeah. heyday periods yeah. as well. So. He was making a living. <laughs> he was buying houses and cars and you know stuff. But uh, 
yeah, I, I certainly got to see what that kind of money was like, <laughs> but I uh, never did make it myself. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, hey, you still got to chase it, right? Yeah. 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 No, I wouldn't, change, I wouldn't trade anything. Uh-huh. I, I learned a lot traveling the world, right? And yeah. uh, But... I always remember getting my first desk job, you know, and it was like, you know, whatever, 35 grand or something. And I was just like, whoa, this is yeah. weird. <laughs> I don't have to race for a roof over my head and it's this much money. Uh-huh. Like, yeah. You're like, so, that's a real number. That's a real yeah. number. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, kind of getting out of racing. This is like my, my last racing question, but, uh, you know, Norbas were huge at mm-hmm. one point and you were racing a lot of those during the heyday of those. And yeah, you got any take i know you're saying before this you don't really follow racing you're not really into it like you once were but you know u.s gravity racing is not now it's not where it once was yeah you got any opinions on that or maybe Hmm. ideas of why i mean like when when you were sponsoring me grts were still huge yeah and those were a lot of focus on those but yeah yeah Definitely not huge though compared to those those early uh, nineties. I, I, I like, like, they're kind of big, but yeah. I just get to hear about it. I never yeah. got to do one. <laughs> and I would say I came in like so my first like pro year was ninety seven. My first like racing year was ninety six. So it was mm-hmm. even towards the end of the big heyday, mm-hmm. like those days with yeah. when Tomac and Ned Overin and like that that mm-hmm. that group of Americans. Um, but I always remember like as I was furthering into my career, like more of the corporate sponsors and stuff, the Chevy trucks were gone. Uh, Mm -hmm. and it it just almost felt like things were dropping off Mm -hmm. as I was trying to progress in it. Mm -hmm. So, but I, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know why. I mean, I think, uh, once you're in the, once you're doing it and you're right in the middle of it, you're just kind of going along with the motions, but you know, I didn't have that like business mind behind why I was going, nor did I like really care. Like I was mm-hmm. still trying to like chase the dream, but I think maybe later in my life, like now at this age, like I could probably look back and maybe start picking out certain mm-hmm. things. Yeah. Um, I do remember like when we first started, like downhill was on like ESPN two, and like there was full on, you know, it was, uh, fully edited versions mm-hmm. of it, you know, definitely no live runs or anything like that. But it was like, I think in 98, that was gone. Like it was no more. So I don't know. I don't know exactly why. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it is an open-ended, pretty loaded question. Yeah. Um, we'll see what happens now from here. I mean, there's, there's some big talk with the new TV and, and new people behind this series. So mm-hmm. I don't know what that's going to do for American racing, Yeah, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We need some more American heroes though. That's for sure. It's true. Yeah. We got a few. There's a few, a few in the works. Yeah. We have a few. Dude, your your legacy's still like stacking up. I'm like serious. Yeah. You know? Like you're getting people like Jason in and then like kids seeing Jason race and yeah. You know, it's still out there. That mm-hmm. was a yeah, no no doubt about trying to pass it on. I got it passed on down to me from guys like EC. So mm-hmm. I always remember like as I was getting that, I was told myself, I'm gonna do that. I, mm-hmm. I need to pass it on. And I had a good run with that. It was it was fun yeah. to watch. Well, Let's get into that because you can't you can't talk about passing down you know the what you learned without talking about AG. Um, let's get the rundown on the Aaron Gwynn story a little bit. I mean, huh. where uh, where did he come into the story in the picture? Good old Fontana, good old Fontana <laughs> Southridge. Um, yeah, I was riding for Yeti at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in that like manager slash racer role. Uh, they came to me and said. Uh, we want you to start like a SoCal development team Mm -hmm. and uh, we want you to pick two riders and we don't care who they are, but we'll, we'll use your opinion. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, let's, let's try that. And uh, I remember an easy choice for me at the time, I was already like buddies with uh, Kevin Aiello and -hmm. he was like just coming up and like, you know, he was, he had the hype. Mm -hmm. He was like the prototypical or, you know, the guy that you'd want to choose. And so obvious, went to him straight away and said, Hey, we're putting you on the team kind of thing. He was pumped. And then, um, I remember going to a particular Southridge race. Um, Cody Warren had showed up and he, I was buddies with him. He was going fast at the time. Mm -hmm. And he, I remember him saying like, Oh, I brought this kid, Aaron, and, uh, he's going to try it. He's this former moto kid. And I remember just like, yeah, whatever. You yeah. Know, like <laughs> I looked over, I think he had like flannel and jean shorts on or something. And I was like, this, this kid ain't going to do anything. He's just throwing rocks at things. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, sure enough, we race and I believe he either got like second or third, but beat me. And I was oh, just wow. kind of like, Oh, there was something wrong with the timing. Like <laughs> th- that was a fluke, you know? 
and didn't think much of it. And then uh, I was still like on the hunt, you know, mm-hmm. looking for a kid. And then we went back again and I think he did the same thing. Like he was on a different borrowed bike, same get up with the flannel and jean shorts and like got second or third again. And I was like, this isn't that, what the hell is going on? (laughs) And I remember sitting under my pit and just like, I'm going to go talk to him. And I think he was sitting with his mom or dad or something at the time. I just walked up to him. I was like, you know, I'm rich, but you know, who are you? (laughs) And and I remember him saying like, I know who you are kind of a thing. And I think he had been talking with Cody or something like that. And, uh, I, I basically just had it in my head. Like, that's who I should pick. You know, like Mm -hmm. I'll just pick this random kid who nobody knows Mm -hmm. and clearly had some talent. Like there was no doubt about that. And, uh, got a hold of Cody and got his number and did the kind of same thing. Like Mm -hmm. just asked him to, you know, do you want a Jersey and a bike? Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing. He kind of just like nonchalantly was like, yeah, that sounds cool. Like (laughs) we'll do that. And I, I learned later that he was like, uh, like he had chosen to go to school at that mm-hmm. time. He was like in the middle of buying books and like, he was definitely mm-hmm. going that route. And then I came and offered him this thing. And of course, like he like dropped everything. It was mm-hmm. like, okay, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's and, cool. Um, yeah. And then put him on the team and gosh, I mean, uh, it was pretty obvious that he had the drive and, mm-hmm. and he had the, like the talent, but, uh, it, it just took off. I mean, it was like, yet he's in the back you know, in my ear saying, you know, if he does good here, we'll, we'll send him here. And mm-hmm. then I would just take that news and go to Aaron's like, Hey, if you do good here, they'll send you here. And, <laughs> you know, and he just kept doing it yeah. and he just, just kept doing it. it. And yeah. And then it was just, the ball got rolling. Uh, he kept getting faster. Uh, Southridge played a big part in his mind because I know that he wanted to beat guys like Kavark and EC out there. And when he did that, just like leveled him mm-hmm. up, um, and then he went to St. Anne and got that ninth place. And uh, right. that definitely, you know, certainly got him noticed. Mm-hmm. And I always remember that race because uh, he, if you guys watch it back, he comes through the line and I saw his time and I saw that he was a top 10, like in that. And I'm freaking out, jumping. Yeah, you Were know. you there? Yeah. Oh, cool. And uh, when he came through the line, he was he shook his head like, like bummed. <laughs> and I'm like what is he doing? Like, you need to act like you're pumped at least, you know? <laughs> and I remember walking straight up to him right after. And I'm like, dude, good run. And he like looked at me and he's like, I could have won. I could have won. Like, <laughs> no, and I'm like, like wild. Yeah. what? Like you could have won, you know? Like, and that really got me like, wow, this kid's mind's like in a different yeah. world. And so I just fed off of it. You know, and there was never, there was never like if or could or anything. It was more like, just go do it. Mm-hmm. Just go do it. And he, he was, he was just kept doing it. Mm-hmm. So certainly that, uh, that began that relationship. We, uh, we stuck together, you know, in those early days and obviously then the sponsors start coming in and then contracts start getting involved. And, you know, I definitely was alongside I'd read enough of my contracts from my years past that like just helped me make sense of what was going on. Mm-hmm. And, when we just built a cool relationship on the backside of that, like just, I was a friend, uh, maybe even like older brother style, like, Mm -hmm. and knew to pick out a few things if, if it didn't look right in a contract or something like that. And he definitely always took the lead though, like, and always wanted to like know everything. Mm -hmm. And so I never really felt like I was an agent, but, uh, I also felt like I had his back and maybe steered him in the right way, you know, certain things like that. But, uh, that was the beginnings. And then, yeah, the rest kind of, everyone knows his story. Yeah. I mean, he just, uh, he set the world on fire, you know, by the time he got into that Trek program and won those five races, it was just like, I was along for the ride. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I, I have some like fond memories of just like how hard he was working and how dedicated he was. It was like, it was definitely like, I would almost put myself in that, like, man, I wish I would have done that when I was his age, Mm -hmm. you know, like he just, he definitely took it really serious and took it like a, like a job and the success showed. I mean, and in the meantime, I was learning things about how sponsors, uh, commitments and expectations were Mm -hmm. just leveling up every year. And so I got a crash course in just what that side of the world was. I I had never made even close to that type of money, you know? So Mm -hmm just kind of going through the with him was, was pretty cool. You yeah. Know? So like, like being at that, like kind of 
top of the highest elite level, like those arrangements versus what you yeah. would deal with. It know? was, it's totally different. Yeah. <laughs> totally different. Um, and I certainly wasn't winning world cups, you know, so there was like, just to kind of get into that mix, but my background and what I was doing and working at hook it did lend itself to at least to like some of the basics and the fundamentals. Um, but I learned, you know, just, just how intense that business side was yeah. and he handled it all really, really well. Mm -hmm. Um, but he also was unique, you know, like he, mm -hmm. as far as like sponsor commitments and things like that, boy, he laid down the law, but like he'd sit at a table like this and straight up look across the table and say, I'm going to win you a world cup, you know, and what are you going to say? I mean, mm -hmm. it's like, and he would go do it. Yeah. So <laughs> If you're gonna do what you say, mm -hmm. then maybe they'll you can get away with a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, outside looking in, it always seemed like Aaron knew what he was worth and wasn't gonna budge mm -hmm. on that. Like he was yeah, in like in the best way possible, very like confident in who he was as an athlete and what he can provide. And I mean, it I would like to think that the way he approached all that during like those early years of great success kind of mm -hmm. helped everybody, right? Like yeah. rise up, you know, like, yeah. And even had that kind of foresight to say that it was like, not just the money, but like mm -hmm. that whole value and yeah. what you're worth. Um, I think it probably did level up several mm -hmm. of people's contract negotiations mm -hmm. because he was able to make that money. He wasn't always public about how much it was, but mm -hmm. I think being so like, uh, set on, yeah. I am worth this but I do need to perform. I mean, he was mm -hmm. doing both at the same time, pretty dang good. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just, it's funny to always think back on that because he was winning so much that, uh, I remember, you know, you, as far as getting away with stuff like commitments to go to, you know, go do a bike shop visit or something like that. I mean, sometimes he would just flat out say no, <laughs> and I'm going to go train or I'm going to go do this. And mm -hmm. everyone was like, Oh, that's cool. No worries. Like, yeah. and then like the day he would get like a second or a third, it was like, Bring rich he's got to come to this shop he's got to go do this it was like the commitments like leveled up as hmm. soon as he didn't win like, interesting yeah it was like and i thought that was interesting mm, that, like yeah, yeah. and he didn't necessarily see that coming but you once you win for a while you know you get kind mm -hmm. of comfy in that particular thing but then all of a sudden you, you remember like no there's stuff you got to do mm -hmm. you know and uh but I, I just thought that was interesting yeah yeah, yeah for sure yeah. that ever got to him I mean, it's hard maybe later, to maybe yeah. later. I mean, I, I remember still being pretty close with them and, and, and when things weren't going absolutely as bonkers as they were, mm -hmm. um, I think he, uh, he might've struggled early on, um, with just like how much of those commitments he had to do. But mm -hmm. I would say he transitioned pretty good now. Like he kind of learned his lesson and he's doing things the right way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I mean, he had a lot of a lot of learning to do. I mean, he got thrown into the mix and it was like, I always say it was just like a hurricane. Like before we knew it, he was winning world cups, making X dollars. And like, I remember buying him lunch at Fontana cause he couldn't afford it. And then now, now he's buying houses like, <laughs> like five years later, yeah, you yeah. know, and driving a McLaren and stuff. I'm yeah. like, like, how does that work? But mm -hmm. it, it was, uh, he had good people around him though. And, and I, he never took it too far. And he was such a good kid anyways that, yeah, that was a, it was a fun ride. For sure. Yeah, it, is, it is crazy looking back now and realizing how quickly it how all quick. happened. I remember being at your house because the the team we had or I was on with you was basically just mirrored what yep. Aaron's sponsors were. Yep. And we were wearing Bell. And so 2012, the first year, we were just he was just wearing like a Bell helmet. And I think 2013 was the first year on Red Bull. Yeah. And we we're at your house and you're like, yeah, we got some pretty big news coming. <laughs> I think you like had one at the house. I was like, whoa a red bull helmet that's yeah. crazy yeah yeah funny too red bull like that was like the one sponsor he always wanted oh and, that's cool. and i you know he had his moto background and, and he had he knew what red bull did for athletes mm -hmm. and things like that but i always remember that first signing day with red bull he was most amped on that <laughs> that's sweet yeah <laughs> And I always remember it too, because up until that point, I could put the team Hausman sticker on his helmet, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden that was a no-go, no-go. Yeah. No I can't put any stickers on I'm like, that's valuable real yeah. estate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's funny. Um, if, if you're going to get into it, you know, let me know. But, you know, you mentioned Hook It, but was that Sponsor House yeah. first? Like, can you kind of talk about that transition and sure. you know, that whole thing? That's my whole next section. So, oh, right on. Yeah. Let's we'll get yeah. into it. Yeah. This will be... Uh, I think I figured it out. Uh, this is my going on my 19th year there. Wow. Yeah. Holy cow, and it did long, start man. out as sponsor house. Mm -hmm. 
Um, same people behind it today as, as far as it being called Hook It. And then even more recently, it merged with a bigger brand called Core Software. Um, it's still Hook It's as an entity mm-hmm. under the Core Software group. But uh, I think it was uh, 2004. Um, I was in between sponsors and uh, found uh, looking online and was just like, I think I was trying to find a resume like template or something to build my resume. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I ran across sponsor house and I like noticed right away that it didn't have any mountain bike stuff and it was all moto. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I used the contact form on there and said, Hey, I'm rich Hausman. You guys should start mountain bike and I need a mountain bike resume. And Scott and RJ, the founders like literally got the email and they were like fans of mountain bike. Mm-hmm. And we're like, what the, is it rich is emailing us. Like we should do mountain bike, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and they like, they at the time had a sponsor house, uh, like branded motorhome. They drove out to the Park City uh, uh, race, uh, mountain bike race, mm-hmm. and uh, it was after the race. I'm in the bar, you know, belly up at the at the bar partying <laughs> and stuff. And here comes Scott, and like shoulder taps me. He's like, "Hey, you know, I'm Scott Tilton from Sponsor House. You remember me? You emailed me, kind of a thing." No way. He's like, "We want to start a mountain bike program." Hmm. And I remember kind of brushing it off, like, eh, "I don't know about this. Like, I'm still trying to be a racer." Hmm. Uh, you know, didn't want a desk job. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. But, uh, got back home. I still think I was struggling to find sponsors, you know, like it was in that like transition, like, is this going to happen? Mm-hmm. And got another call from him. It was like, Hey, we're, we moved to Carl, uh, to Oceanside and, uh, we definitely want to do this mountain bike thing, come down for an interview. And I just like, all right, I'll go do this. And went in there. There was only, there was him, there was Scott, RJ and one little, one office assistant and then I was going to be like starting the mountain bike thing. And, uh, I, I definitely was like on the fence. Like mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily want a job, but <laughs> I knew that like it was a legit move mm-hmm. and, uh, just jumped in head first with it. And that began like this, this whole thing that mm-hmm. I've been doing for like the last 19 years, which is kind of crazy to say, but, um, I learned a lot, uh, just like any internet business that, you know, it's got to evolve with the times. Um, you know, I think I probably had 15 or 16 different titles there from <laughs> marketing manager <laughs> to athlete support or whatever, but what's, what's the general, I mean, description of what it is, or at least what yeah. it was back then. Yeah. So I actually, it's funny. I, today I'm still managing the original business model that they have, um, oh, really? which is really just build a profile online as an athlete brands have the same profile and the software allows the brand and athlete to talk digitally and the brand can offer support in the form of sponsorship through the system. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, building profiles and social media and the way things have kind of evolved, it's certainly, it has evolved, but the core concept is still build a profile, show off yourself, Mm -hmm. show it to a brand and a brand support you. And I think obviously the, the bread and butter of the system was more at that like grassroots style sponsorship, mm-hmm. definitely not, you know, salary type deals being offered mm-hmm. through it. Mm-hmm. But I also learned a lot about like what that level meant to a brand, what mm-hmm. it meant to, from an athlete's perspective and just learn that other side of the table. Yeah. Um, I had always had logos on my jerseys and gotten mm-hmm. support, but I didn't really realize like that budget style behind it. And like, what did that mean to send me on a, you know, to a race and what that cost and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's more formally called hook it, but, um, still managing the same thing. It's just that I now manage all of the sports and all of the brands on there. So it's anything from moto to flat track to BMX to any mm-hmm. athlete on there. And then there's about, I think there's like 50 or 50. 58 brands on there that are still using oh, that wow. old system. Wow. Cool. So yeah. I took it, uh, took it over my, I won't say I took it over myself, but I, they allowed me to run that old style, that old business model mm-hmm. by myself working from home and, um, been doing that for like the last three and a half years Oh, cool! just on my own. And while the rest of the business exploded into social media data and mm-hmm. tracking, mm-hmm. um, which is still going on, but, uh, I kind of took the reins of the old school and it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Can, can you touch on like what the other side is? Like, yeah. I mean, it's, 
a lot of data and just gathering stuff for brands, but yeah, that seems like a big focus. Yeah. I mean, I think just in general, when I say that, like I, I think I'm more specific about just like what a, a marketing budget was and mm -hmm. what it took to actually send a team across the country. Mm -hmm. Like I just, you know, as a racer, you're just looking for that salary, right? And how much can you pay me? And I didn't realize it was, you know, 30 grand just to send a kid across the country to a world cup season, mm -hmm. you know, and that was money that I never saw. I never knew. And then to like know that that was part of a budget put into place like a year and a half or two years ago that, they were planning for and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like I just didn't, I didn't know that stuff. So to kind of see it and know that there was like people's jobs behind that, that had to do that and plan for that. Like it was just a little bit of a crash course into that side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll kind of get more into sponsorship and, and hook it stuff, but I'm just curious when you decide to take that full-time job, like, yeah. did you have a, identity crisis or anything kind of hanging up one part of your life like yeah. i know that was hard for me kind of hanging up racing so yeah yeah now it's funny you say that because that was probably the the biggest hurdle to get over mm -hmm. early on was uh, you know sitting at a desk typing away on a computer and realizing that i could be out riding mm -hmm. right and i was still racing so it was, i didn't give up the racing side at all okay. like i certainly um was going to do both and uh it, it was a mental like challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, oddly enough, it took me probably, I would say a solid two years of just like toying with like, am I doing this the right way? I know I'm making money, but I, what if I, you know, put this down and could I, could I still do it? Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was, you know, after that first couple of years, I'd realized downhill was just going to like not be, you know, my main focus. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to like, from Yeti's perspective, they allowed me to focus on slalom and forecross. And so like, I would take my like dirt jumper bike to the work. Uh, we had a pump track in Temecula that like was pretty, pretty popular at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, that the rainbow one, it was the rainbow oh, one sick. built by Chris Kavark, by the way. Really? Oh, yeah. huh. <laughs> um, it's still there too. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> um, but I just remember like packing my bike in the back of my truck, sitting in the desk and then like, you know, five o'clock bell would ring burn out of there, sprint to the pump track, get my 45 minutes in. Mm -hmm. And then like it, it allowed, like, I guess I won't say I was more dedicated doing that, mm -hmm. but like my focus was like, I had to get that time in and where, mm -hmm. when I wasn't working, it was like deciding how much I did mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. It was, but, uh, the funny thing is, is I had that full-time job and I forget how far into the desk job I had, but like in 08, I had, I won the four cross national title hmm. and I did it all while having a full-time job. <laughs> so, oh, and that's sweet. Uh, I tell people often, like, I think it was because I wasn't racing for like a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. Like I knew that, you know, if, if it didn't really go my way, like mm -hmm. I still had a job yeah. and I was going to these events and like getting away from the desk was like in a vacation mm -hmm. again. It was a fun again. And, uh, maybe that helped, but, yeah. uh, yeah. So I didn't really have any like pro titles until I had a full-time job. So, that's so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that's super funny. I don't know. It worked out that way. Yeah. But, that's cool. Yeah, that's yeah. sweet. Yeah. That's, that's kind of how I went. I was always racing when I was working, but I think you're right. Like you, not all your eggs are in one basket, right? Yeah. Just more yep. carefree. And then you're, you're like, I'm out of race. I'm not at the desk. Right? This is the best thing ever. <laughs> right? yeah, if you're just training all day long, maybe you don't take, you take it too for granted. So yeah, no, I know. I, I, I think, uh, having the responsibility as a job, like also played a factor into like how, how like time set aside for when it was time for training. Like it just, it just helped me organize my life a little bit more. And, uh, I guess that's the reason, but <laughs> it wasn't your stereotypical, like go and chase a championship as a racer. It was like, I had this like desk job and it always felt a little bit weird. But, <laughs> yeah. Did, yeah. did that championship kind of satisfy your need to get back out there and race? Like, did you settle it down after that and go into the job a little bit more? I did. Um, I had won, uh, there was the one day national title in, in, um, Oh six that I, I think I better look at my years. Either I won the, the title in Oh six and then won the national champs in Oh eight, but vice versa. Like, I think what it definitely did was though, is it, it helped me like take a deep breath and say like, okay, I, I won something, mm -hmm. you know, like, cause 
honestly, like living with EC for my the early parts of my career, I mean, he was winning a lot yeah. and winning titles and making good money. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it almost felt like, like I, I wasn't that much slower than him, you know, mm-hmm. like I was like mm-hmm. right there, but I'm, I'm making like a 10th of what he's making, mm-hmm. you know? So it was a little bit disheartening. Like, yeah. is this ever going to happen kind of a thing? But, um, I would say I took a pretty big, deep breath after that title. It was like, I accomplished something, you know, like I, I've been mm-hmm. doing this for a while, but, uh, it, it did help to kind of like, you know, maybe not chase it as hard after that, you know, like it was like, it was there, I did it. And then I could tell that like the work life was going to be, you know, where you make your money and what mm-hmm. you're going to do. Yeah. So it might've helped me take a little bit of a, a breather <laughs> after that. Yeah. And, That's yeah. sweet. Well then like, did your daughters come around sometime after that too? Is that like in that same, same yeah. time frame? Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure that yeah, my oldest plays was born in, uh, 2008. Okay. So yeah. yeah. And our, it's funny you mentioned that too, because growing up with, or not just growing up, but like traveling the world cups in the, in the national scene with EC, um, he had had his boys during that time. Okay. And I can remember being on the road with him and like, he, to have and to see that struggle of wanting to take care of your kids who are at home, but then also have the pressure of like trying to win races was gnarly on him. And I remember thinking like out loud, like I'm not doing that. Like Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. So after that title in 08 and then my daughter being born, like it was like a good time for me to just kind of like, okay, I could focus on family life and have a job Mm -hmm. and still be involved. You know, like it wasn't like I was out of the scene, but, um, once, once you have a daughter, (laughs) things change anyways. Right. So (laughs) like there's a, there's a little bit different priorities at that point. Yeah. That's sweet. Should we get into some sponsorship stuff? I mean, I have a whole list here of just random things. Well, I mean, I don't know. It's a, it's an ever evolving (laughs) topic, I guess. But, um, I mean, we kind of touched on what hook it does and stuff like that, but I've kind of just some like random specific ones. I mean, like you talk about social media presence and all of that. And we mm-hmm. were, we were talking about a few athletes before we sat down that it seems like nowadays just going out and winning races, like you have those individuals who make a career on that, mm-hmm. but that isn't the only way to provide value to brands. And I don't know, maybe just kind of touch on how you see that sort of landscape yeah. and it's broad, but yeah, it's, it's broad, but, um, you know, that, that winner, that uh, mm-hmm. shows up to events and wins and gets, you know, the sponsor because of that. It's it's just so rare. Mm-hmm. You just don't have that many winners, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's not very different, at least in our sport. Yeah. Like, I mean, it seems like one or two or three guys kind of mm-hmm. dominate for a decade, and then it might transition to somebody else. But yeah. um, I think when social media started getting its its uh, it's claws in. Uh, I think I, I realized that there was value behind it. It was like that virtual magazine that you always wanted to be in. Mm-hmm. But, um, I think truly like what you said, like there's, there is a way for you to market yourself online or on social media that brings value back to brands. Mm-hmm. And, maybe learning a little bit more about that through my work was that it also translated into sales. And if you're selling and you're sponsored, usually you're going to keep that sponsor. Yeah. And so if you were doing it right and the brand did see sales from that, um, I think it was a way to keep your sponsors. Mm-hmm. Um, there were some old school guys, like guys, like I think of like Kurt Voorhees where he was a full-time racer and that's the dream he was chasing. But there was a point where he started doing videos Mm -hmm. and started like Mm -hmm. having a personality outside of just his racing Mm -hmm. and, and made a living off of it. Mm -hmm. And I think almost in the, like the world of like virtual, like that's what social media kind of showed me is like, you can be and do stuff different and not have to win Mm -hmm. or at least try to win every race and still bring that value back. But I did realize that you kind of look out there and it's just not very many people win. Yeah. Not very many people win. For sure. So you better be doing something that shows the value behind that. Mm -hmm. And I guess before there was social media, there was really only the magazines and maybe if you were in a video or something like that, but I think it was the magazines that you felt like you had some worth if your photo showed up and you get a photo bonus Mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's the social media thing is still evolving. 
Mm -hmm. and we're still learning a lot about it. I come now from that data side of it Mm -hmm. where there is data behind it. And, uh, to see that side of it is, is also pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not, it's not a race to how many followers you have these days. That was a question I had. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Is it always about just who has the most followers, but I figure engagement is much more valuable. Yeah. And that word engagement is kind of like loose, but yeah technical in its own way. But, um, the earliest days of when we started through hook it, um, tracking the data, one of the first things we did was put like a top 100 list on every sport. Mm -hmm. And what we ranked it off of was how many in interactions or engagement the Mm -hmm. athlete got. And so what we saw, what we saw on our list was maybe the guy at number one could have had like half the number of followers, Hmm. but his engagement was a lot higher. Mm Mm-hmm. And, uh, like technically speaking, that would be like, if I take my old school mind, like if I was in a magazine ad or had a photo, it'd be like tracking how many times someone like stopped on the page Mm -hmm. or like had slobber and like, Oh, I like that, Mm -hmm. you know, and (laughs) I'm stopping here, (laughs) but technically you could actually start to track that. And Mm -hmm. it was, it was a way. So like you're tracking like, okay, I'm scrolling through an Instagram feed for instance, Mm -hmm. and Vori's comes up and I stop and mm-hmm. look at it like that's that's trackable. engagement yeah okay. well and if it's a video comments or yeah. other things like that technically speaking it's the comments or the likes or the uh you know depending on the platform it's a retweet it's a mm-hmm. share on facebook and each of those have their own value yep um on instagram which is definitely the most popular now um it is like the harding of the photo a comment even following someone is an mm-hmm. interaction what about like uh, people sharing your video sharing. Yeah. Yeah. That's all Mm -hmm. technically an interaction, but it, our system originally looked at how many followers to how many interactions you produce. So Mm -hmm. it was like a power to weight ratio. And from the early days of like putting that list out there, you could, uh, you could certainly see who had a big, huge following. Mm -hmm. And that technically speaking, you could also see like someone that had an absorbent amount of followers, but just did not produce the interactions. Mm-hmm. Um, at that time, the, like the biggest, like we'll call it like a mystery out there was, could you buy followers? Mm-hmm. And you really could. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But again, like for me, buying followers wasn't that bit, like wasn't perplexing to me or wasn't like weird um, because you bought ads. Right. And you, mm-hmm you, you put mm-hmm. a magazine ad together and you're hoping that got you followers. Mm-hmm. So if you were to like go buy followers with like boosting your post, then it was just an ad, but mm-hmm. where technically it got, uh, uh, it got weird was if you had a bunch of followers and didn't produce a bunch of interactions, it, yeah. it would kind of show that you were just buying followers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you bought followers brought them to your page and you got a bunch of interactions. Great move. Yep. That was like smart. And those that had that kind of planning and forethought to do that, they were ranking higher on, on, on our data side of it. Mm -hmm. And in the end, what it does translate into is sales though. Mm -hmm. And if, if you are getting posted or getting interacted with a product, typically that product is being sold. Mm -hmm. So it's not unlike anything else though. Like if, if someone really liked a magazine ad and stopped mm-hmm. on it a lot, the brand is hoping they sold that product. So it's mm-hmm. the same idea. Mm-hmm. It was just kind of making that full circle. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely not a race to followers though. Mm-hmm. Um, at least in the, in our world of data and sponsorship tracking. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, so interesting. I feel like maybe athletes forget that you're a marketing asset to generate sales. Like, of course you get supported yeah. typically due to your abilities but it's with the understanding that those abilities or your yeah. eyes on you has a return. Yeah. But cause like, I feel like when I was a hundred percent, I did some sponsorship stuff. Mm-hmm. And so people will come to me assuming I understood sponsorship, <laughs> but I think I knew more honestly from you and, and being a racer myself. Mm-hmm. And I've always had the, the point of view that like, somebody like me is probably dime a dozen. There's a bunch of people that are really fast at riding bikes mm-hmm. and a bunch of people are really fast at riding bikes that aren't going to be Lloyd Bruni mm-hmm. or, you know, Aaron Gwynn. Like we already know who those dudes are. There's right. a bunch of us that are fighting below that to yeah. make something of it. And you need something else yeah. that you're, is a value, yeah. you know, like just sending a resume with a list of results, even if some of them are like 
you know, you should be proud of it. Yeah. Doesn't always mean something, you know? True. And, True. um, yeah, it is interesting just hearing about, you know, how you can have a bunch of followers or out, you know, people can be like, Oh my gosh, they must just have brands must be dying to be a part of what their program. But yeah. if no one's like engaging with it, it doesn't really do much. It's true. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, uh, we've learned things or I say we, but I've learned things watching what data does. And, and I think there's, there's still a lot of common mistakes being made on social media. Mm-hmm. And I do think it's that, like that instant gratification of getting a follower is still kind of like driving a little bit too much of the like hype. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'll just use one example is like, I don't know how many of you guys have seen an athlete do a post, but then they'll put like, I don't know, say six or seven different hashtags. Mm-hmm. One of them might include the brand that they're trying to use, but the other one might be hashtag MTB or mm-hmm. hashtag we do that all the time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's but who does that? <laughs> the idea is, is that, First of all, the data shows that no one clicks past the second hashtag. Hmm. Okay. And the only reason you put a hashtag is, is so that you click it. Mm -hmm. And so if you put a hashtag though, so if somebody goes like, if we're talking to Instagram, goes like a search feed, they can search hashtag MTB and ideally yours is towards the top. If you get a lot of interactions off of that post. So if MTB is sixth or seventh on the list, that post is not going to get interacted with. Okay. Okay. So on top of the fact that the from an athlete's perspective, if you're using a, a big rack of hashtags, first of all, no one clicks past the second one. Mm -hmm. So you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're sponsored by seven or eight brands and you're using that brands hashtag Mm -hmm. seventh or eighth in the list never gets clicked. (laughs) And so you're not really going to sell product and Mm -hmm. it's a fractured post is the, one of the technical terms we use, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but the, the idea was though, it kind of started from the, just the general public. Like if you put, hashtag California on your post and you got one or two followers that day, that general person, yay, you know, I got followers. Mm -hmm. But if you're an athlete promoting a brand Mm -hmm. and you're from New York Mm -hmm. and you really like you, but then you put California on there, that fan is never coming back. Mm -hmm. You, you pissed them off. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so that we've learned that, uh, using one or two hashtags or just one sponsor in a mm-hmm. post is like worth 10 hmm. of another post. So okay. it, keep going further with that, that we also now have a lot of data behind the idea that, uh, or not idea, but a lot of the contracts for some of these upper tier athletes mm-hmm. are based on a promoted post. So instead of asking that athlete to just use their hashtag on every post, they're paying them for, mm-hmm one or two per month that are just with that sponsor. And the value is just exponentially higher Hmm. for those posts. So is is that value still there or is it starting to dwindle a little bit when, I mean, I don't know if it's fair to say like Instagram knows like, Oh, Mm -hmm. this is kind of a sponsored post versus something that Mm -hmm. the athlete would naturally post is it's still there. I still think it's, it's definitely still there. Okay. Um, but it's also been watered down. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, I think we can all pick out the athletes that maybe is trying too hard mm-hmm. or, you know, doing yeah, too that much, balance, huh? there's yeah. that balance and there's that believability or an authenticity meter that it's tough. Um, mm-hmm. if, when you are sponsored and you have these obligations, you just want to puke it all out. You want to mm-hmm. say, here I am, <laughs> but to have the patience to do just one sponsor per post with mm-hmm. a piece of content that's relevant. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's the game. Yeah. And at least from the technical standpoint that there's data behind those is definitely what has like allowed athletes to make good decisions off of data. So Hmm. it's just not commonplace still. I think, uh, there's still a lot of questions and do I do this and how many times and things like that. And unless you are really studying the data, it's, it's hard to, to Mm -hmm. know, I guess. Yeah. So would you say for, let's say an athlete has six sponsors, Mm -hmm. they do sponsor one, one day sponsor to the next. Could you go as far as doing like six posts in a day, all individual sponsors, or does that like kind of muddy it up? I would say that muddies it up. But if you have six sponsors, that's six days worth of content. Sure. Easily. Mm -hmm. And those one per day, like I said, are worth 10 times the doing the six in a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause like it's still how much can you consume in one day? Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with clicking hashtags that are past two or three. Um, that you just don't have the patience. People don't scroll. I mean, 
maybe your number one fan that like will watch every single thing, that's not who you post for, mm -hmm. right? You, you want to post for who's going to click the most times on the most things. So mm. again, even simple stuff like putting a hashtag at the end of your sentence compared to the first mm -hmm. is night and day. Yeah. What's more valuable beginning or end beginning. Okay. Yeah. Just, but like, it's not like, it's just natural. Like if you see mm -hmm. it first, there's mm -hmm. a better chance of you clicking that. If it's it makes sense. buried at the bottom of your post mm -hmm. and you have to scroll, no one scrolls. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. interesting. We're taking notes over here. <laughs> yeah. I know. Our, it seems like within the last like year or two, maybe just reels and kind of TikTok style and like mm -hmm. kind of, you know, as impossible as it sounds like more rapid content consumption is coming around. Are you seeing that influence what, you know, the return is for a brand or a writer or anything like that? Yeah. Well, tech for sure. Instagram stories are, are leading the way with <laughs> engagement. Um, TikTok doesn't provide any kind of backend API data so that you can't really, you can just see face value, like what you can see on the page, mm -hmm. but their engagement is super, super high at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's only because you can like see that that person has this many followers and this mm -hmm. is how many likes they get. Mm -hmm. Those numbers for those that are doing it right on TikTok are Instagram high. stories are higher than reels mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm hmm. And they've actually toyed with what, what a reel is, yeah. um, that, and how long they can be and mm -hmm. things like that. They've mm -hmm. been messing with that, but in general, Instagram stories are by far leading the way. Hmm. Yeah. Just leading the way and just engaging, people engaging with them yeah. and yep. interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. Cause I mean, we're not vital, isn't a athlete and stuff, but we operate in a similar way mm -hmm. and working with brands and stuff, but like. I wouldn't say we value story. Usually it's like, we'll just throw up a story because it's easy for whatever it is. Usually if there's something's maybe a little bit higher priority, it's focusing on like the post that goes with it mm -hmm. or like a story is like, well, that's like the minimum we'll do just to like make sure we're pushing that content through some other channel in the site. Also, you know, Insta's putting stories front and center on YouTube and mm -hmm. right across the yeah. top. Like they clearly know what's getting in if they're not just pushing that. Mm -hmm. So that's also just generally speaking, it's, above and in front of regular scrolling totally. posts. Yeah. So it's always there. It's yeah. always yeah. there. So, and it's easy to stop and just let those roll mm -hmm. as opposed to actually physically moving your thumb. Cruising around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah Man, we're just, how lazy <laughs> can we get? It comes <laughs> down to just seconds. Though. Seconds. Yeah. yeah. I do. They also know <laughs> so uh, how long you watch a video yeah, too. Sure. So like, I think it was technically, they wouldn't track the data unless it was past three seconds. Hmm. Um, but that's changed down to one second for the, because the stories are quicker. So mm -hmm. they're actually doing it by one so second. Now. Insane. Man. Yeah. Wow. That's nuts. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're kind of touching a lot on social, but if somebody's a, a, a mountain biker and a rider and they're trying to come up and get sponsors and stuff, what do you mm -hmm. think? You think brands are prioritizing social and, and engagements and all that the most right now or? I do. Um, I think brands are learning quick. Um, you know, the hook its focus is certainly on the brands when mm -hmm. it gets down to the, the social media data. Mm -hmm. But, um, I do think that brands are paying attention to social, whether they have the data behind it is kind of, uh, it's hit or miss with that. Mm -hmm. Um, those that are tracking the data though, and seeing who's doing it best are using those examples to teach and educate the athletes under them. Mm -hmm. And it's just like a perpetual wheel. Like it, if it's, if it's working, you know, kind of yeah. keep doing it sort of a thing. And then it's translating into sales. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think if you're an athlete that Instagram is still number one mm -hmm. and you should be focusing there, but I get that asked a lot. Like, should I have a Twitter still? Like I don't do Twitter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my usual response to that is, but you know, somebody's going to do Twitter. And if mm -hmm. you've got Insta, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube dialed, and you're doing a good job at all four of those, it definitely increases your value. Mm -hmm. So you can choose not to do them, but what if someone is, you know, kind mm -hmm. of a thing. And if, yeah, I mean, uh, each of those platforms are different though. I mm -hmm. mean, Facebook's, uh, like age or, you know, demographic is trended it's a lot higher. Old people. Yeah. Right? 55 plus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but they if, have the money sometimes they right? have the money and they're mm -hmm. willing to sit there and watch a two minute video, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in a 16 by nine ratio too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. So like if you're producing content and mm -hmm. you're trying to put it on Instagram and 
sharing it over to Facebook at the same time, it's usually not a good idea. Yeah. Um, but the demographics are different and yeah. the, the, the concepts are different. I won't say that I'm a pro on each one of them, but we've clearly seen Instagram take the lead for the last yeah, five, 10 while. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's number one for sure. Should, uh, should riders still be making yearly resumes and PDFs and emailing them to brands or is, uh, the, <laughs> is that, question. is that dead? Uh, no, is, I don't think that's dead. Uh, I think it'll stay for as long as, you know, the brand is willing to read it. Mm. But, um, I think in those decks you should have how well you do and perform on social media mm -hmm. though, and, and know what that means. Cause sooner or later the brand's going to figure out the data side. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if they know more than you or you don't know, then mm -hmm. I think that could put you behind the eight ball a little bit, yep. but yeah, I still see decks working. Um, if anything, the follow up once you are sponsored and still s sending a personal email or race reports and things like that mm -hmm. still means a lot because yeah. these days, uh, that personal touch and it's, it looks like a personal touch now that you like put someone's email address in and put it on there. And like, it feels a little bit more like they took their time. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. still means a lot. So. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get emails from Timmy. Hey, I'm a mountain biker. Can you send me free stuff? But yeah. you know, like spellings everywhere. And yeah, like, there's right. no info. Yeah. I'm sure you get that all the time. You get it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned spelling too. That's one thing I always heard was if something's misspelled on a resume or on a profile, like the, it's like the immediate no. Hmm. And, and I've, mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't tell you how many times like the kids that are, you know, typing like as if they would text someone, yeah. you know, like <laughs> yeah, for sure. lowercase letters and stuff like that. But yeah. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about that to some degree of like the people like in charge, you mm -hmm. know, of kind of making the decisions and everything, like maybe they're a bit older like me or like you and yeah. take certain things like that into consideration versus kids coming up. Like as we kind of move out of it and a younger generation comes up, will that, do you think that'll change or do you think it'll still be important at that kind of upper level? That's a good question, but I, I think it's still going to remain important. Okay. I do. I think, uh, ultimately you just, you, you, I think that is consumed as though that you're taking your time and that you're, mm. I don't want to just say you're educated, but, um, you just, you care, mm. yeah. you know? And I think if you care about that, then you're going to care about the product and the, and the environment you're in, and you're going to kind of translate out into a good representative. So I think if from the beginning, it looks like you don't care, then I just do think it puts you behind. I mean. I don't see it going away. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is hook it going to have like a, a typo demerit? Like it takes you down your score down or something. <laughs> uh, if it doesn't do it, uh, officially it does put you down. So like, I already know if you misspell stuff and don't hmm. capitalize it, it definitely puts you down below. Okay. So yeah, interesting. I won't say your points go down or anything like that, yeah, but, but it's definitely something I've heard for as long as I've been at hook it. Wow. Okay. From the team manager level. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Spell your stuff right. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because when I was at 100%, I ran our hook it. Mm -hmm. That was like, that was, you know, during uh, the fall that encompassed most of my time. Because I think some brands maybe just have where you can um, make a profile, apply for a sponsorship. And depending on what you kind of have on your profile, you might fit into certain categories. But we ran all of our amateur sponsorship through it. So mm -hmm. I physically went through every resume mm. and looked at the differences and like the time people would put, or kids would put in, you know, and it was super apparent. Yeah. And, uh, but I remember I had like my, uh, copy and paste of like yeah. why you didn't get sponsored. And yeah. like the first one was, well, you have a conflicting sponsor on your profile yeah. and kids would be like, well, like, you know, I'm not going to wear X brand or whatever it is. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, if this was yeah, sure, this feels maybe more casual because it, looks like Facebook or, you know, it's the first time you've done sponsorship, but like I would never go out to common Saul and be like, I want to write for you guys next year. I also have a giant deal next yeah. year. You know, yeah. like it's like, that's not how it works in the real world. And yeah. like, this is how you learn. I think that's, that's a good point is mm -hmm. that, uh, hook it. And from before those days, sponsor house, it was such a learning curve mm -hmm. and it, I was surprised that not everybody knew that, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. they, they would technically just not know that. Mm -hmm. And so you get told one time though, yeah. then hopefully you just don't make that same mistake over <laughs> and over. So I'm sure there's been a lot of education coming through the site and coming through stuff like that. And I I'm think sure. 
yeah, I do remember you managing that. And I was, <laughs> I was always, uh, took a big deep breath when I knew that there was a former racer behind some of these programs. Cause <laughs> it was like the kid couldn't come on there and say, I beat Aaron Gwynn yesterday and you should sponsor me. Like yeah. you would know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, I guess it goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> kind of a random one here, but sometimes we post things on Instagram and they go absolutely nowhere. Like we'll have consistent post engagements and uh -huh. then we'll post something and it'll have like, I mean, it's like a hundred likes and a thousand views just hmm. so throttled. Do you have any idea why that happens? Hmm. And, it, and it's usually a post that's not crazy out of the way. Like seems you, on seem to figure out that like if we have text or a title on the image, like Instagram's like, nah, beat it. Yeah. But yeah, something that mm -hmm. we would think like, oh, that one did well. This is similar enough. Like, what yeah, we're, yeah, we're, I'm, a lot of times we'll be like, I'm going to follow the blueprint of something that did well. Yeah. And yeah. it just doesn't hit. Hmm. We're get, we get conspiracy theory over here. We're like, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> we know it comes down. I mean, to I would it. have questions like, it, did it, was an athlete in the post? Um, Usually it's is it product a, or brand. Product or mm -hmm. brand. Uh, sometimes you can chase the lines back to like, does that product or brand that you're posting about have good engagement or not? Um, that could be one thing. Interesting. Um, but I can't, I can't claim to know what, yeah, the, what yeah. that one is. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've also seen weird stuff, you know, like I've, I, I could use myself because I was posting, you know, videos of my daughter's playing soccer mm -hmm. and making it as a reel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, you have my normal, whatever, hundred friends and family who always clicked stuff. But then I noticed that, uh, like randomly all of a sudden a lot of foreign, uh, like Europe and across the world, mm -hmm. I'd get likes from people that clearly weren't in the U S and mm -hmm. it just kind of showed me that after a certain uh, time frame that they would expose it to your following, they were taking that content and then like testing it. Like, let me put that over in, in yeah. Europe and see how it did. And then all of a sudden you'd get like triple the amount of likes and comments and, and I don't know why, hmm. maybe it's just part of there, but I, I have no idea why. Um, <laughs> yeah, interesting. yeah. yeah. Spooky. Yeah. <laughs> and it will be the first to say like, it is, it's super fun to like, Oh, blame the algorithm or blame this and that. Yeah. But like, yeah, we know if like people don't watch it, it's because it's not good or they sure. didn't want to watch it. Sure. You know, it's not some conspiracy out to get us or anything. But, yeah. Yeah, and I think the that authenticity meter is ever present these days, and I think it's kind of easy to see when someone is trying a little bit too hard. And as the consumer of that, like if you pick up on that, that could be your moment to like not like it. And if you believe it more, or you like you're bought into what this person is po posting, then of course, like those are the legit likes and comments that you're getting these days. But I I felt like. At a certain point, it was obvious that someone was trying to post six times a day to get just get more likes, hmm. and uh, I think the the uh, the crowds and the and the people consuming social are are learning more about what's believable or not these mm -hmm. days. So yeah, I sure. think um, I like that you said that. Like sometimes it's just clear. Like maybe we just didn't do as good a job on that post, mm -hmm. and if it's not getting as many likes. We just got to try harder next time. Yeah. Or something mm -hmm. like People that. just aren't interested. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But there is some quirky stuff out there. <laughs> I don't work for them, but yeah. for sure. I just look at the data. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Data don't lie. No. <laughs> with, without going down too big of a rabbit hole with three guys sitting here, like, do you think it's tougher on women on social mm. media? Like, do they have to yeah. present, present themselves as objects in their bodies and yeah. their looks? Yeah. It's, I mean, I have two daughters of my own too, right? Yeah. That, that, uh, they just kind of got rolling on Instagram pages and, and it's certainly like, uh, it, it is different. Um, I've worked with, uh, Annika Beerton, mm -hmm. um, kind of later in her career and just started just, I'll call it consulting on what she has to post and things like that. And, you know, she's up against other competitors of hers who maybe go a little bit gnarlier with what they wear or what they look like. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. others are just very focused on their racing or something like that. And mm -hmm. she was always like kind of torn between like, what, what do I do? But mm -hmm. I mean, it was like obvious stuff, you know, like she was wearing a little bit less in a particular photo or video, it got more likes. Yeah. And, uh, I saw it translate out like onto the real world stuff. Like I remember being at an event, uh, I think it was big bear, and I forget why we were there, but, uh, she had posted some like workout video or something like that. And there was this like guy that was like near us 
and was started saying like, you know, you should, you should post more of those and something like that. Just creeping out, you know? Mm -hmm. And I I remember thinking that exact thing, like, this is different. Like you just don't, you don't hear uh, ladies, you know, come up to guys. I mean, maybe Mm -hmm. in the like celebrity world or something like that, but just from that particular creepiness. And then obviously she telling me that, you know, the type of DMs she gets and Mm -hmm. stuff are just, just weird, you know? So to answer your question, it's a lot different. Yeah. And yeah, it's unfortunate, but I don't know what to do about it, you know, like, Mm -hmm. except for, you know, now that I'm a dad and with two girls that could Mm -hmm. be on Instagram, like, it's like, I'm keenly aware of, you know, what, what I don't want them to post Mm -hmm. or, you know, like Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And yeah. And then the pressures of their friends doing certain things. I mean, it's just, it is different though. And I think that objectifying side of it is probably the creepiest part of it. And yeah, it's, it's real for sure. Yeah. It's too bad. It has to be that way, but right. Yeah. 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 It's a bummer. Yeah. My, my dad, my dad sense starts kicking in. There's no doubt about it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what athletes out there do you see as really crushing it with their social, Mm -hmm. um, presence and like, maybe something from one of those athletes that you would recommend like other riders do. Hmm. Good question. Um, early days when we put that top 100 list, we were Mm -hmm. speaking about, um, in the moto world, it was Ken Roxon who, uh, and who had bike, um, Troy Brosnan is always a name that, that came up. Uh, uh, and well, two different stories. One Mm -hmm. with Ken, um, what I noticed he was able to do was he's super believable. Mm-hmm. And of course he had the results to back it up and, you know, he definitely could win heat races or win a main event, but it was like the fourth post that you would see would be like him babysitting a nephew or something. Mm-hmm. And he just had that way of like making it real. Yeah. Um, and then with Troy, like I, I just used his name because he was always towards the top of our list, but in his own way, he was like super believable, mm-hmm. um, and didn't try to do, try too hard Mm -hmm. not like Uh, real curated yeah exactly Mm -hmm. and so i don't know why those two names stick out to me but that was like kind of the earliest when i was first looking at data but Mm -hmm. um i do think just to go back to these days like your number one challenge is to be believable Mm -hmm. is is and it's tough i mean there's obligations that are in contracts now that you have to post a certain amount of time Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes the brand will send you the content and then does it all look the same? Yeah. Do you write the same thing? Like mm-hmm. is, that's not all that believable these days. And so there's, there's definitely an art form of to putting your own twist on it, yep. but then satisfying what the sponsor wants you to show. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's a challenge. Um, so it's, I, I kind of know the fundamentals about it, but like picking one or two out, it's kind of tough. But I think these days anyways, like the, the biggest challenge is to be believable. Yeah. And that to not sense. look like a robot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I definitely saw that early, early on was like the brand clearly would send it out to every sponsored rider. And then like within seconds, like you see the same content <laughs> over and over. And it's definitely like, mm-hmm. eh, like I guess trying to make it look like you weren't forced to do that. Yeah. But still have it believable and, and, uh, uh, make someone click on it and buy that product is, is tough. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, the, that's just the truth, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But. yeah. Do you guys, um, also pull stuff from like YouTube as well? Mm-hmm. Like, does, does it seem like if you're a pro athlete these days, like you should be doing a vlog, like yeah. that's something that you should just add to your yearly to do. Um, I think like technically speaking, they don't really release much data unless you have 5,000 subscribers. Okay. So if you're under that, then like maybe the effort isn't all that needed. Mm -hmm. But once you get to that level, um, the same data presents itself. And so our system and our technology can look at every frame of every second of every video. And wow. Are you serious? Every, (laughs) yeah, yeah. That's crazy. And that's like the logo recognition side too. So like we can pick out if the logo was present or visible or in focus and things like that. So those that are doing it right, like, yeah, YouTube is, is definitely a big deal. But mm-hmm. I think if you're just doing it to do it and it, it's not like fo- it, maybe mm-hmm. you're not at that 5,000 subscribers yet, then mm-hmm. maybe you could focus on something like Instagram before yeah. that. But um, it's viable for sure. Man, that's, yeah, that's crazy. That's nuts, yeah. <laughs> so 
okay, I ride for Maxis and Jensen. Thanks for sponsoring the show. Yeah. And I make a video and, you know, Maxis logos in there just, you know, naturally. Yeah. For 30 seconds and Jensen's in there. Like, does that go towards a score on my profile somehow on hook it or just into some, it doesn't do it, not on the me? profile side, but like the, the, dip, the, the way to explain that is if, if Maxis was using our data dashboard, mm -hmm. we would show the value on that post because the logo was present and in focus and then the interactions on top of that. So okay. our system would be able to give a, like a, well, I say a dollar value, but it's, that's kind of an arbitrary word, but like, mm -hmm. um, we can value those posts for the brand. Okay. So at this moment from the athlete profile side, no, but like, I guess my rebuttal back to this is make sure the logos are visible mm -hmm. and, and in focus. <laughs> yeah. And if they're blurry and not, then you're not giving the most value back to those sponsors. Huh. Interesting. Does hook it do, um, offer a service to individuals or athletes to, go to say Maxis and yeah. be like, Hey, throughout the year, your logo was seen this many times in videos and here's a value associated with that. Or it is does. it only to, for brands to do that? It's, angle? it's been focused mostly on brands, mm -hmm. but there's been some pretty unique uh, situations that in fact, I just did it. Um, but the, the athlete, there is a service for mm -hmm. the athletes. It's just been kind of rare if they've approached us. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the first ones that I actually was a part of and, and at least helped set up, it's still going on today is there's a skateboard girl, Leticia Buffoni. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's huge, huge, online. yeah. Mm -hmm. Big following. Um, he's not afraid to post, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, like yeah, to sure. get the lights, but she's also but, a ridiculous skateboarder too. Yeah. So it's yeah. Like, she goes backs that up. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I happened to be like, you know, at the office and picked up the phone and just happened to be her, her agent. Hmm. And, uh, they were like sitting at a, a round table with Nike and, um, hmm. the agent spoke up and kind of said, Hey, I, I think Leticia is like 10 times more valuable than Nyjah Houston, who is also a, a Nike SB mm -hmm. athlete at the same time. And, uh, we think she sells way more shoes and is way more valuable, but didn't have the data behind it. Mm -hmm. hmm. And he ran into our system and said, Hey, can you guys value that? And so we put the purports together and got her, got it rolling. And it, sure enough, like her numbers in engagement compared to like Nyjah was just through the roof. Wow. Yeah. So hmm. we gave the reporting to them. They used it as negotiation. And from what we were told, like a few more zeros got put on the end of it. Wow. And that was definitely like, oh, that works, you know, mm, but yeah. it's not cheap. And, you know, she had, you know, it was probably making the type of money that, you know, she could pay a monthly fee for going and finding this data, but mm -hmm. to hear that it translated out into dollar signs, um, certainly, and she's still using it today. Yeah. Um, she has like her own dashboard of every one of her sponsors that mm -hmm. at any wow, moment crazy. that she can turn around and, and send a report back to wow. in the value world. Man, so but that's so smart. Like that's yeah. for sure her job. It must yeah. be working, you know, yeah. it's still <laughs> going on, but, uh, yeah. I actually just, uh, it's, it's random, but, uh, I got approached by this, uh, this mountain bike, uh, pro, uh, Ludo may. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Euro dude. Yeah. 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 So a couple years ago he had, he got in touch with us and ended up wanting the same style of report. And he was riding for, I think BMC at the time mm -hmm. and, uh, got a report from us that was like similar for what he had done with BMC and was using that data to like help him show his value. And so yeah. I guess he just signed with, uh, or has been on a new brand score yeah, mm -hmm. um, yep. and wanted to do something, the same thing and called the randomly. And I happened wow. to pick the phone up and it's like, <laughs> yeah, I ride mountain bikes. Like uh, I know what's going on. And, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, he didn't, he, he didn't do the, the logo recognition side for score, but he did all of his posts and what he's, what his value was back to them and sent that over to him like a week ago. And it was kind of like, uh, it was almost a revival of like, Oh, this does work for athletes too. Yeah. But like, I think he kind of, he, he's sharp mm -hmm. and he knew what everything was and he knew why he wanted it mm -hmm. and he knew what he was going to do with it. Yeah. And so I think, uh, you need to probably educate yourself first before you just want to go pull a data report. But, mm. um, I, I technically say that, yeah, I think there's quite a bit there like, yeah. for an athlete. And, you know, I think maybe the fact that it's, it's not cheap, you know, it's probably playing a big factor is mm -hmm. people kind of think, well, I can just look at my insights page on Instagram and da da da. But like the feedback from Ludo was like, yeah, I could look at that, but how do I put it all into a cool report 
that looks cool and that can show the brand. And it's not easy to like screen share from your insights back mm-hmm. end of your Instagram sure. account. So it's there, but, uh, it hasn't taken off, um, from the athlete side as far as wanting that deep of a dive mm-hmm. on okay. data, but at the very least it's, it's there. Yeah. yeah. And I know I wouldn't be surprised if after this you hit up by a few people. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, that's I said the same thing to Ludo because I just hadn't really done it in a while. But mm-hmm. after looking at that report, I was like, man, for that price and for, <clears throat> for what he's going to do with that, like it puts the athlete in the driver's seat a little bit more. Yeah, yeah totally. And, and can like prove it kind mm-hmm. of thing. So until you see it on paper, though, it's kind of hard to prove it. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you might just tell them, yeah, I made 10 posts. I did it. But if you don't know the data behind it, then, you know, like, is it really valuable or not? For sure. Yeah. I mean, it, you go back to like, a photo in a magazine Mm -hmm. and that was like yeah it's in there and you know how many maybe magazines were sold but there's no connection between how many bikes got sold that year and your name being attached to it yeah it's kind of insane that actually at a point where like everything now that you can trace it back and trace it yeah for sure that's wild print mags were always so nebulous like oh yeah yeah, we ran a hundred thousand like but did 10,000 yeah. of those go in the dumpster? Cause right. you know, mm-hmm. the printer overprinted. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you didn't know how many people looked at those. No. No. And, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Now you can. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Huh. Um, I'm at the end of my sponsorship questions. Okay. Do you have any more curiosities? Yeah. Shoot. I had one in my head. What is it now? <laughs> <laughs> Crap. What is it? I mean, kind of talking about the thing with, with Ludo, um, do you think there would be instances where a rider might think they're more valuable than they are? Like if they ran a report like that or mm-hmm. does it kind of, that's interesting. You, know, you say that like what you can see just, you know, on generic Instagram metrics. I think, um, for, for what it's worth, like until you benchmark yourself against someone else is probably where you could learn a lot because, um, we didn't do that. Like I didn't put him up against, I don't know, I can't use a name, but like, I, mm-hmm. I couldn't really like run his report and then set it alongside someone. I didn't do that. But I think if you knew, if you knew that your data was valuable or in line with someone that's like in your same, like kind of category, I think, uh, obviously that, that would help. But I, I would answer your question and say, there probably is instances where an athlete thinks that they're a little more value just because they did it. And if they actually knew their data, and they lined it up with someone that was similar, it, there could be a, like a smack in the face moment mm, with yeah. that. But I can't pick out any instances like that. I just know that it's technically probably true that yeah. someone might think, well, just because I'm such and such, and I just did it, that it is that valuable. Um, that might've been where I could maybe trace back to when we had athletes that weren't, weren't leading our lists in, the, in our rankings that had huge followings, but they were like, 50th on the list hmm, interesting. so we definitely got questions on that quickly but we could answer them with just you don't get as many interactions hmm. so yeah if you don't get interacted with you're probably not selling yeah that's okay. the way to look at it i remember uh what i wanted to ask and you know maybe you're not aware but um a writer lou, B- lou buchanan he got sponsored by only fans hmm. and there's all this dust up of you know like who are sponsors going to drop them because only fans is you know porn site which right you know a lot of people use it for that but he's saying like no they want to change the face of you know what people think of them i think similar in moto there's a couple riders doing the same thing but right do you think that could be Hmm. a move that his sponsors would be bummed on do you think they might be into it if it works interesting um I would say it's, it's obviously going to depend on the mindset of that sponsor going into it. And if, if they view only fans as just a porn site, mm-hmm. then probably, yeah, I think it would be a, a, a knock or maybe that sponsor would want to pull out. But if, if they actually, if the content is viable and it is getting engaged with, and there's a way to prove that, then I think someone that's smart enough would say, yes or you know or keep going or rolling with it but Mm -hmm. um i would have to think at this point if there's just that like gut check feeling about that site and that person from the brand that is sponsoring doesn't like it i would say that still plays a huge role and if that's going to move on or not but Mm -hmm. i guess i could only say that there's good data behind it (laughs) (laughs) 
you know, <laughs> that doesn't lie, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, but I had heard, uh, at least on the moto side, what was that kid Carnell? Logan, Logan Car Carnell. Yeah. yeah. I think he's the only fan sponsor of Supercross racer. Yeah. I saw the, at least I saw the front ends of that. Like I, I definitely saw that he was making that move and yeah. that it was something new and different, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good question. Yeah. And some, but, some people I think brought up that one of the UCI rules is that you can't have a sponsor that I don't know how it's worded, but like uh, you can't have playboy a, or, there's a clause or something. Like that, or something. Right? Yeah. Huh. And like, does only fans fall under that? Mm. Interesting. Yeah. 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 But it's even, I don't know if he's even racing. Yeah. I don't think UCI, he's trying but... for, for world cups anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Huh. So. Yeah. That one is interesting. I feel like time will yeah. tell all, totally. you yeah. know, yeah. because it's like, I mean, without knowing how much only fans is paying him, if that makes up all what he was making the year prior with all the other sponsors, mm. like maybe it is worth yeah, it. And I don't, sure. yeah. you know, it's, it's hard to know what position he's in and what his mindset is on as well. Yeah. Maybe yeah. time will tell. Yeah. A few things probably need to shake out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was comparing it to when, um, CBD was kind of first mm. becoming popular. I think it was Dean Wilson who had like a sponsor for that. Yeah. And it was like a whole fiasco, like a one. Yeah. And now like CBD's, like such a normalized thing. It's yeah. not, no one's freaking out about it. And right. Who knows? Maybe it's even almost already taken a back seat, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. not where it was. Yeah. It was, I think Chad Reed had also had, totally. yeah. Wanted to run the helmet before it was a, an actual sponsor. And mm -hmm. well, it ended up being a series sponsor like a year later. That's right. Yeah. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. I think yeah. Dean yeah. probably posted something. On yeah. He's like, I see where you are now. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, there's a, uh, some creativity that is probably still being shooking out and like that, that needs to probably get the data behind it. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm usually going to wait until I see the data. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That sounds certain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, can, if you don't want to talk about it, we won't put it in the final thing, but just like we were talking about win masters before we sat down Yeah. and his value and things like that. Is that something you can, speak to or is that too inside with what you do no i th i think there's a way to speak about it with without being you know super personal about it okay. but um i mean I, I guess that's a good example of someone that isn't tipping and on every single podium mm -hmm. but also has found a creative niche to gain a following outside of, or inside mm -hmm. but with a different like medium right yep uh, and using uh, i would say he's a hell of a rider and has a lot of skill and can show that too. Mm -hmm. But, uh, his value and, and what he can do and, and, and bringing that side to it is just a kind of an, it's a new world a little bit. Um, but also he works really hard at mm -hmm. doing that. And, and I think, uh, he's might be just a good example of an, of, of a new age, uh, rider who can like take his, ability on the bike but also translate this over into like the media world mm -hmm. and kind of play both sides um so i mean i i guess that's answering a little bit of like what he can mean to it but he might be a perfect example of someone that isn't going to win a race necessarily but mm -hmm. has a ton of value behind what he can do yeah i know i, I think about someone like loic bruni mm -hmm. where he's obviously one of the best right now but he comes across quite genuine and he has his, his, he's a personality. He seems like almost like the perfect athlete in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. super believable. Yeah. yeah. Believable. You feel like you can connect with him if you've never met him. Yeah. Um, which is sort of just tangenting on that. Like, yeah, there are, there's, there's angles, right? Like yeah. you can, you can be a value outside of just between the tape. You so. certainly can. I think it's tough to come across and be so honest like he is. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's one word like just to come to mind, like in an interview, he's not afraid to say exactly how he's feeling <laughs> mm -hmm. and like, and it just comes across believable. Yeah. So yeah. you usually can relate to someone that is not afraid to say the truth. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you think it helps that he's top of the pyramid right now that if, okay, an 18th place person had the same transparency, would, would we care oh, as much? No, we wouldn't. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's, it's that he can be so honest and then go win mm -hmm. and, and like tell you why or how, mm -hmm. or, you know, what, like Ken. what it made it feel like. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think, uh, that's like the, the cream of the crop, 
right? To someone that's capable of winning a race, but then also bring that piece back so believable and have the following behind it. So yeah, it's just so rare. Like yeah. it's not, it's, it's hard to win a race in the first place, yeah. but he seems to be able to like, I I'm just thinking about like how he's, he's said out loud that he likes to qualify first so that the pressure is on him. Mm-hmm. And then, but he says that and then goes and performs. <laughs> so like you want to see him like qualify first and be nervous yeah. and win. Like, it's just, it's uh it's fun to follow that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like a part of the ride. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he's, he's winning, you know? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> it's like a that, Palmer effect a little that's bit. It's crazy in its own right. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Palmer. <laughs> uh, um, start closing out. Yeah. If I don't know what your last question is, but rich kind of where you see, what you're doing, social media trends, kind of that stuff and say the next five, 10 years, what it's like to be an athlete. If you have any kind of predictions mm. of what that might look like. <sighs> predictions. Um, I don't know if I have any predictions, but I do think, uh, you certainly, um, you're going to want to focus on social media in a way that like we've, we've kind of beat the su- subject up, but don't be a robot. Don't, don't make it look like you were forced to do it. And, um, maybe just that believable believability piece has probably got to rank right up there. And, um, I think also that, uh, maybe focusing on not just one platform these days, like I, I it gets brought up a lot. Like, should I have a Facebook and Twitter or YouTube? But we, we touched a little bit on YouTube, but I think if you can have all three, um, and do them all well and have certain pieces of content that fit on ball three, um, are just going to help you out. So I guess that would be some advice as far as not predicting, but more advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. No, I love it. Um, let's close this out by, uh, you're a big soccer dad now. Oh boy. Like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what, what's, what's day to day life like for oh, a big man. house outside of all the sponsorship <laughs> stuff? Right. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you asked cause I'm mm-hmm. so proud of him. And, uh, you know, that, that dad life is, is definitely my, uh, my number one job, mm-hmm. but, uh, no bikes, huh? They never, they never went down the bike route. No, though. no, they didn't. <laughs> well, they could ride at like two years old and they could shred on that and cruise around, but soccer bug bit early on. And mm-hmm. a year ago they, uh, they both, um, decided they wanted to try for like the, technically the best youth league that there's in the country. It's this girls Academy league. And, uh, there was a team tryout down in Carlsbad, which is still like a, you know, an hour drive from where Mm -hmm. I'm at. But we literally went down there with the both of them one night and they like, they made the girls Academy team in the first night. This was like a, you know, it's solid year ago. And then that just like really elevated the, the travel and the commitment. And I could kind of, put my focus into that, but it was also like, it was pretty intense. Mm. And so, um, I didn't make like a super conscious decision, but definitely, uh, I, I'm, I'm the hell of a taxi driver down to the soccer <laughs> fields. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we we take off to Florida in two weeks to, oh, cool. for a big tournament, mm. but, um, they love it and they're, it's a competitive environment and, you know, we're, at least I can use some of that that old school mentalities of, of working hard and trying hard and, um, you know, performing under pressure and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. But, uh, it's, it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a different world a little bit, but, uh, on the same token, it's, it's very similar to a lot of the competitive nature or competitive environments I've been in. So, um, but for now that's, that's who I am. And, uh, <laughs> uh, as long as they want to do it is, is where I'm going to put all my focus and time. I mean, I still ride, but, and I use the riding as kind of like a release and, mm-hmm. and more of just like a breather. But, uh, for now it's, it's soccer dad life. That's sweet. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Dude, yeah, you just, cool. when you talk about them, you just beam like your face yeah. lights up. Right it's on. so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're my life. And yeah, it's, uh, I do enjoy it. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's sweet. Awesome. What, uh, are you, are you an e-bike guy now or are you regular bike or I, I, I'm regular bike? Right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm still sponsored and get support from nuke proof okay, and uh, they, right. they did just have a, well, not just, but I think they've had a, an e-bike come out in the last year and a half or so. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I was, uh, when I, 
when e-bikes came out, I, I went and I remember did a race uh, when Troy Lee was running races, the Boogaloo or something out at Vail Lake. And I rode yeah, one yeah. and uh, I wasn't very impressed and like, it just didn't, wasn't that fun. And mm-hmm. uh, I remember trying way too hard pedaling the stupid thing when <laughs> you should just go about like 70% and get uh-huh. the same out of it. Um, but like I turned 45 next month and uh, I said to myself, like maybe when I turn 50, Mm-hmm. I'll go get an e-bike or something <laughs> yeah. like that. But up to this point, no, uh, I, I don't have one and ha- haven't really made that jump yet. Yeah, that's funny. And cool. Yeah, there's no need to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sweet. Well, uh, that was super fun. Yeah, um, I'm so glad you came by. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully you and I don't go another five years without seeing each other. In yeah, chat. yeah you're in town now. I know. Yeah, yeah. I'm, we're local enough, yeah. you know? I'll have to come out to you. I won't make you drive here next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll go ride Bale Lake or something like yeah, that. Right. Yeah, right. Shoot, I haven't been there probably since you dragged me out there at some point. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting good. Yeah, it's getting good. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Sick. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. thank you it's guys. Great. Appreciate it. Right on. A big shout out goes to Jensen USA, Max's Tires, for supporting the inside line.